So uh, it is 6.31, so we are going to get started. Uh, so I'm going to call the meeting to order. Uh, so the first thing is to review and approve the agenda. Um, we're going to have a couple of changes to the order uh, this evening. We are uh, going to keep the uh, veteran homelessness proclamation and the audit report where they are, and then we're going to move um, the uh, combined heat and power project uh, contract as well as the PFAS conversation, uh, shifting both of those up to just after the um, audit report. So those will be um, just after item six, uh, unless there are other objections or ideas. Okay. Uh, yes? Do we have, uh, oh, maybe it's already taken off. Okay. You're good? Oh, no. Item seven, the solid waste management. Do so we have an applicant at this stage? There is, actually. So it's worth having a discussion. Yeah. Thank you. Great question. Uh, okay. Any other uh, uh, amendments to the agenda? Okay. So we'll consider the agenda approved. Uh, so on to general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the council uh, I'm sorry, any member of the public <laughs> to address the council on an item that is uh, otherwise not on our agenda for the evening. Um, so, and if you would say your name and where you're from and try to keep your comments to, keep to about two, two minutes. minutes for you. <laughs> okay. Uh, good Welcome. evening. My name is Zach Hughes. I'm over in Prospect Street neighborhood. And I just want to um, rise tonight to discuss uh, real quick. Um, these last couple of snowstorms have uh, caused quite a situation uh, for me to, you know, get in and out of the city um, from where I live. And there was a couple of nights I had to call for help because I could not transit the sidewalk. And I understand that there are things that are beyond the city's control, such as ice, and you'd have to take blow torches to it and all that. I get that. But there, there are chances that I have to take sometimes, and it's very risky. So I just want to rise and uh, talk about that just briefly, and I thank you for your time. Thank you. Hi, Elizabeth Parker, um, and I'm here uh, for the Sustainable Montpelier Coalition, uh, and. Uh, First of all, I wanted to recognize what you did at your last meeting um, with your vote um, recognizing uh, the climate and the issues around it um, and that resolution, so thank you. Um, on tomorrow night, we are having uh, a film. It's called the Climate Action Film Festival. It is um, a wonderful film of nine shorts uh, curated by Sun Common. It will be at the pavilion uh, from 6 to 8.30, and we would love to have any of you come, and please pass the word, because I think it's going to be very exciting. Uh, this will be uh, an effort to support the work of VPIRG, uh, VNRC, and also the Climate Youth Lobby. So um, do pass the word along. And according to Roger Hill, the storm will have cleared by then, so it will be good to go. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to bring this up as public comments before everybody goes to sleep and leaves. And that is there are going to be some changes to GMT's public transit routes, and it's really important people go online. There's some major changes to the two-route commuter, 100-route commuter, and to the links. So please go online. Public hearings will be posted. Okay, uh, so we're gonna move on to the consent agenda. Is there a motion regarding the consent agenda? Second. Further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great, uh, all right. And so on to the uh, Veteran Homelessness Proclamation. So uh, I wanna invite uh, Stephen Luna up to the, the table up here um, and just tell you a little bit about um, about this briefly. Uh, so I uh, was introduced to this, to the mayor's challenge uh, to end veteran homelessness, um, gosh, some months ago now. And uh, 
in part because of the form of government that we have, you know, it's, uh, we don't have a strong mayor form of government, it seemed appropriate to me to bring um, this mayor's challenge to the council. Um, this is what Winooski did as well, and so it seemed like uh, an appropriate step. Uh, and, and really it's about ending um, veteran homelessness, and especially with our discussion about um, homelessness uh, recently and the, the efforts that you know, we're, we're putting forward to, to address uh, that topic generally, it felt appropriate to, to bring this up. So um, I'd, I'd love to turn it over to you, uh, Stephen, to talk about, uh, give us a little more detail. Sure. Is this on? Yes. Oh, very good. Um, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Steve Luna, and I work for Supportive Services for Veteran Families at the University of Vermont. Um, that's my paid job. The other job that I have is, is as chair of the Vermont Veterans Committee on Homelessness. Um, we've been around since 2015 and made up of um, mostly all of the veteran service organizations uh, throughout the state. And we're charged with um, coming up with uh, a program, systems, put systems in place that will uh, bring about an end to veterans' homelessness. Um, we're doing a pretty good job. We've seen numbers go down over the last uh, year or so. And just recently, uh, I was introduced to the Mayor's Challenge. About a year ago, I was um, first informed about the Mayor's Challenge. It's a program that's been around for a number of years. I think um, George W. Bush um, started the program. Um, then uh, Michelle Obama was a big champion of the Mayor's Challenge. And then it went dormant for a little bit, and um, it's kind of coming back with a, with a vengeance uh, lately. And it really is... Um, an effort by all of the organizations that work with um, work within the homeless um, arena to come together and create a, uh, a system, create um, a buzz, if you will, about um, ways that we can um, meet the needs of the homeless community. Beyond just veterans, um, the Mayor's Challenge also works towards ending homelessness for all of the other um, homeless um, folks out there. So um, I, I'm here representing the veterans, but there are uh, a number of other um, really deserving groups out there that uh, um, we should look at as well. So the Mayor's Challenge here in Vermont, um, we have eight mayors. And as of tonight, hopefully, we'll have six of those eight mayors on board with Mayor's Challenge. So we really look forward to Montpelier coming on uh, onto the uh, onto the group as well. Any questions? Uh, Connor, then Donna. Yeah, no, and you might not have this, Steve. But uh, out of Vermont's homeless population, what percentage of our veterans? Ooh, uh, yeah, I don't it have might be a hard number to like even come up with. Right, I can tell you. I can tell you the the, uh, the number of veterans that are homeless that we currently have um, record of, and that's um, we are right now at 59 homeless veterans in, in the state of Vermont, which is down um, considerably from um, even this time last year, we had about 87. So we're down to 59 at this point. 5%? Sure, 5%. <laughs> sure, 5%. I'd, have to pull, I'd have to pull my calculator out. But <laughs> Donna. So I, I like the proclamation, but what can we do? Are there steps you're going to lay out to what we can do beyond this proclamation? How do we put it into any kind of action? So the proclamation is a, is a, is a good first step. Um, as, we, as we head down this path, like I was telling uh, Mayor Watson, one of the things we're doing in Chittenden County is, is we're going to ask the mayors in Chittenden County to do a uh, joint press conference. Um, and a, a, we're going to call it a, a call to action. Um, we're really, really close. Uh, we have single numbers in Chittenden County uh, of, of uh, homeless veterans. So we're really close, and we need the mayors to get out there and get the word out to the community that um, we need some housing for, for a, just a few veterans. And so when we get to that point, right now in Washington County, there are 23 veterans that are, are homeless. And the reason there's um, such a large number of homeless veterans here in Washington County is because of the Vets Place in Northfield, which is transitional housing. Um, and unfortunately, um, at least from my perspective, unfortunately HUD considers those, anybody, whether veteran or not, that are in transitional housing to be considered homeless, which seems crazy to me, but I don't write the rules. <laughs> so as we, as we move forward and we, and we um, um, start this process, really start to dig into um, finishing it, 
being able to submit an application to USICH to claim we've ended veterans homelessness. We'll probably be coming back to ask Montpelier for that call to call to action. Yeah. So where do they end up finding homes? Wherever they can. Um, I mean, but you're making the matches? You're supporting them or connecting yes. them to agencies? Um, beyond that, we have, uh, um, we have case managers that will work okay. with them through the whole process and then stay with them after the fact. So it's, it really depends on which program they're in. If they're, if they're receiving um, a HUD-VASH voucher, which is similar to Section 8, they will receive um, case management for as long as they need it. <laughs> if they're in our program, SSVF, which is um, rapid rehousing, they'll receive um, case management after being housed up to six months. I guess behind my question is, is it for most of the cases a matter of money and income or a matter of available housing period? Uh, the, the, the reasons are as, as varied as, they, as, as the veterans themselves. Some of them just need some extra money to you know, pay off some back rent or pay off a, a bill that didn't get paid so they, they aren't um, evicted. Some need that, that uh, down payment or the, um, uh, the first month's rent and the, and the security deposit to get into a place. Um, some need a lot more than that to include you know, more specialized help. Any other questions? Okay, great. Is there? A, thank you. And is there? A, is there a motion? I'll make a motion to adopt the proclamation to end veteran homelessness. I'll for this. It. Great. All right. For the discussion. Uh, all right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Great. Thank you, and thank you for your time and coming coming to speak to us. All right. Thank you, yeah. and thank you all for uh, for passing the pro proclamation. Yeah. We'll be in touch soon. Yeah. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and so now we have uh, an audit report. And if you're here for that, come on up. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Welcome. I'm Ron Smith, Miranda McDonald, <coughs> Miss Kelly Murphy. Heather, you want to give a little introduction before yeah, I go? So would you mind moving that microphone over there as you? Thank, Thank you. So you. Much. Is this good? Yep. Okay. Perfect. Well, I don't. I don't know yet, <laughs> actually. Can you hear me okay? No. 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 Okay. Let's see. Testing. Perfect. Okay. Um, so we are here to talk about the audit, um, and I wanted to provide a brief introduction before getting into the details. Um, and you sort of heard generally who we are, but. Being a new group on the scene here, I just wanted to provide that introduction formally. Um, Kelly Murphy, Finance Director. Heather Graves, Senior Staff Accountant. Ron Smith, Principal, Larry Chow Smith & Company. Miranda McDonald, Audit Manager. So now that you know who we all are, um, I just wanted to note that um, RHR Smith & Company was engaged in May of 2019 um, to do the FY19 audit. Um, and the purpose of this audit is to express opinions on financial statements, <coughs> governmental activities, business activities, ensure state and federal compliance, and meet uh, generally accepted accounting standards, um, and then also provide the single audit for anything over $750,000. Um, to that end, um, the news tonight is good. Um, we have received a clean opinion, an unmodified, um, unqualified opinion over last year, um, which basically means, in a nutshell, that um, the city statements are presented fairly and appropriately and are in compliance with general standards. Um, and so on your desk in front of you, you have the audit, but then you also have the presentation materials submitted. Um, and I apologize if my back's to any of you. Um, You've got the uh, presentation materials, which um, includes a balance sheet, um, statement of revenues, budget to actual, and um, GF revenue by source and area of expenditure. I also did want to note that if you do want to go into executive session for any reason, I'm just reminding you that you have the option, um, if you should so choose, to discuss items within the audit that you wouldn't necessarily want staff present for. So with that, I will have them take it away.
I have a loud voice. Is this too loud? Nope. So I'm Ron Smith, and I'm the principal with uh, RHR Smith and & Company, and, and uh, this is the first year, as Kelly said, that we had the pleasures of doing business with Montpelier. We audit in the states of Maine, Vermont, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire, probably over 400 governments, so we know a lot about who you are and, and certainly what you do. I hail from the great state of Vermont. I was born and raised in St. Johnsbury, Vermont. Miranda was born and raised in southern Vermont, Texas, you know, so uh, so we certainly uh, know a lot, you know, about Vermont, and certainly I don't want to go through a hundred-page document with you all, so I'm just going to hit the highlights, you know, of that, and uh, just tell us some of our observations and best practices that we saw from Montpelier and answer any questions that you guys may have, you know, of us in the process. So as Kelly stated, we gave you an unmodified opinion for your financial statements. Um, there's actually two audits that we do, as she stated. There's the financial statement audit and the federal compliance piece to that audit. Um, we found no issues, you know, with findings or question costs with the federal compliance piece, meaning you're spending the U.S. federal government's money the way you're supposed to be. And then we found nothing worthy, you know, of fraud, defalcation, or no reason to modify our audit opinion. So as she stated, well, you got the highest opinion, an unmodified opinion for June 30, 2019. And to hit the highlights, based on a budget with capital transfers and your general fund operating budget, which is about $14 million annually or was on June 30, 2019, we like to see you all at about 30, 60 to 90 days of your operating budget. So what's that mean, you know, in Montpelier terms? 1.1, 2.2, $1 .1, 2.3 $1 .2, 3 .3 million dollars is the range. You're at about 1.5, which is uncommitted and not tied down to anything, which is a slight increase of a little over $200,000 from last year. So I'd say that that's great news, you know, for the city of Montpelier. You're at about 45 days of your operating budget. I think that the goal to shoot for and to be consistent with your policy is to, you want to get it about 60 days. That's the benchmark we like to see all of our governments at, you know, and Dinette, is, is this, as, as I can attest, you know, to Montpelier and Lane in my bedroom at 11.30 listening to trucks going off and doing construction projects outside the window. This is a busy town. And you have put a lot of money into infrastructure for sure. And we see no reason why that's probably going to stop in the, you know, in the near future. So it can be expensive when that phone rings for sure. And uh, one of the things that we want to talk about, you know, being the outsiders looking in and working with Kelly and Heather, you know, is just talking about all this infrastructure, you know, how we're going to maintain it, how we're going to pay for it, the capital plan and any adjustments, you know, that you uh, that you uh, may need to make here to your existing you know, plans and policies that you have. So uh, um, I would suspect over the next few months, you know, as we get together and engage in these dialogues, that there's probably going to be some, you know, um, uh, uh, understanding brought to this council, certainly for recommendations on that, you know, as we move forward. Because like I said, it's a, it's a busy town. You've got a lot of, uh, a lot going on. And I would say that that's probably one of our biggest talking points is what you have going on and, and the cost of it. But more importantly, the future maintenance of those types of things, you know, and your capital plan. So I think that that's a big thing you need to look at and consider. Um, your enterprise funds are busy. You have a lot of them, water, sewer. Um, uh, uh, you have your heat district. You have your uh, um, I'm missing a parking fund. So I think that all of them are financially, you know, within, uh, you know, within the constraints of where you, where your expectations would be. But I think that the one thing that stands out with all your enterprise funds is the amount of money that you've put into your infrastructure, water and sewer, you know, specifically. So, so again, I think that that's going to be a big focal point that we'll make over, you know, uh, this next audit and just making sure, you know, that, um, you know, that we have a plan you know, and in place and, and based upon what our old plan was, that the plan now will be modified and acceptable to, to just meet the needs and meet the growth of Montpelier is probably the best way that I uh, can say that. So um, there were a couple of best practice comments that we had. Uh, procurement was one of them, you know, for sure. Just some, some suggestions that we made regarding procurement and looking at your federal funds. Bank reconciliations, we, we saw some delays in bank reconciliations this year at the city, and, and certainly that's an area, cash is king. You know, that's the area that you certainly want to pay your attention to. And, you know, we saw no issues of any, you know, mismanagement. I think it was just time. I think that, you know, to, 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 as, as your outsiders coming in and being the new outsiders coming in, 
there's a lot of new faces in new chairs, you know, specifically now, you know, and even on the way out the door during the process, you know, there was some transition and personnel too within your finance department. I think your people did a great job, you know, in getting through that exercise, but it was definitely a year of transition and, you know, and given that, you know, and I think getting other people to sit in chairs and look at things like the way that you have your organization, there was really no repository, you know, to go to, to get information. It was all over the place and I think with some suggestions with your staff there was some you know some conversation about that and just just maybe a better easier way to facilitate that going forward you know whether or not you you know you have a debt you know a debt repository whether or not you have a TIF repository you know and things that would pertain to that would reside in that you know so so there was a lot of conversation regarding best practice but again I think given the transition and a lot of the new faces that you have in your finance uh, department I think kudos to them you know, they certainly responded and and uh, allow us to sit here in front of you and saying that uh, the ship's pointed in the right direction. And we look forward to being part of that journey and look forward to giving you guys advice going forward, for sure. Thank you. Any questions? Donna. Oh, and then Dan. I want about your questions. The bank reconciliation and the purchasing, what you found, was that different than it happened in other years? So speaking on other years, I would say the bank reconciliations were the new one, as I recall, based on a previous any previous year management comments. Yeah, there were some uh, there are some new ones, and and I don't know what to let what level of depth of conversations that got had, you know, between your former finance director and your former auditors, you know. But those are those are just some of our comments and observations that we uh, that we made for so, this year. So, so with the, the banking reconciliation, it's sort of to indicate too much busyness and not doing that. With the purchasing, you're saying the system wasn't in place. So, and that needs to be established. Yeah, so okay. I, I think that there's some better, pro there's a lot of ways to say that you did things correctly. And I think that, you know, some of your, or, or not correctly, I'm still trying to find the balance but in the middle of there. But whatever that way is, you know, I think it's probably fair to say there can be improvement, you know, here in Montpelier. But going back to the bank reconciliations, as we understood it coming in with your entrance conference and kind of through the whole duration of the process, is that... Uh, um, there was there was just other time sensitive things, and then with some of the transition that went place, there were, it, it was explainable to us, you know, to see. And and as as we have shared with Kelly, and if we share with Heather, those are the things that we know that there'll be improvement on because of the new new places, new bodies, and and and, and the time constraints are different this audit than they were last audit for sure. So. I had two questions. First one was about the idea of a maintenance fund that you're, or maintenance funds. Um, is this something that you don't see now that will have to be developed, or is it because, and is it because these projects are emerging? Yeah, so, so a couple of things. We actually see the intent. We see a capital projects fund. We see capital projects in there. You know, we see a lot of infrastructure, you know, uh, projects going on here at the town. And we see that you've got existing policies, procedures, and we see that you've got some, inf some uh, for lack of a better way to say it, a current blueprint. And what we're saying is, is with all the infrastructure going on in the town, you know, just like you probably did when you said it was time, you know, we were growing here in Montpelier. There were things that we need to do. Maybe some of that was deferred maintenance. So guess what? Let's do it. We're saying now, stop. You're do you've done a lot, you know, and I think to as you continue to do a lot, look at your blueprint right now and make adjustments where necessary. And that's one of the things that we want to work with your uh, finance team, you know, on because I think that that's time for sure. So, yeah, and 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 in my outside professional opinion, I don't think that there is enough money, you know, that you have sitting in for for replacement or maintenance reserve, whatever it is to take care of and establish this infrastructure that you're spending so much money on and will continue, you know, to spend money on. That's where I think the blueprint is going to need some adjustments. Okay, and increasing funds. And correct. Funds. Correct. The second question I had was about the enterprise funds. Uh, you seem to indicate that we had a lot. Um, was that necessarily a criticism that we should be looking No. Okay. So when I met by a lot, is, 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 uh, all the enterprise funds that I can think of professionally, you have them all. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot. <laughs> okay. you know, so, so, so let me say that. Minus now, an airport. Minus yeah, minus, you don't have an airport, <laughs> but I'm not sure I'd call that an enterprise. I don't see many airports making money in this day and age. <laughs> but here's what I'm sure of. You have a lot of them. You know, and I'd argue you check all the boxes, as we would say in our standards. You know, but 
also, you can see the emphasis with those enterprise funds and the infrastructure needs that you're putting in there. I mean, you can see your balance sheet growing by millions of dollars, you know, every year because of all the infrastructure upgrades that you guys are doing, you know, and, uh, and that's what I say. You have a lot. And you're spending a lot in those areas. Right. And I really think that that's probably one of the, you know, areas besides TIF and, you know, some other things that you have going on here. That's where I really probably would focus some attention on going forward for sure. So. Thanks. Jack. Um, one question that occurred to me, and it's not critical of anyone, but uh, the fiscal year ended June 30th. Now we here are at the end of uh, February. Is that... Is that timing an issue? Is that a normal amount of time? No, we like we like to. So, so, so that was actually talked about during the entrance, and I think what wasn't allowed, you know, really at the end of the day, is your departure of your finance director, your departure of your long-standing controller, you know. And I know the audit got pushed back a couple of months, you know, to get in here. And this is not criticism on anybody, uh, you know. I, I I think the fact that we're sitting here and actually we're sitting having conversations back in November and December with your management to make sure that you guys had no surprises. Um, that, I think, is the testament to the process. If we were sitting here now saying, well, we, we changed our conversation that we had back in November and December with your management, that would be, I think, a, a, a concern that I would have in that chair. That didn't happen. You know, but uh, normally we like to turn the process, and I think the goal was December 31st was to have the process complete. But statutory deadlines, you've met them all. Um, this uh, March 31st is the big one to submit your federal compliance audit, so there's been no delay, you know, certainly in that. So. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I was thinking that it might be useful to have the audit complete while we're developing the uh, budget for Correct. the next fiscal year. We, so one of the things that Kelly and I had talked about before we actually walked into the chambers is it's nice to know and do some prognostication as early as possible. We like to come in through our pre-audit process as you're, you know, developed voted on your budget, you know, just to just to make sure, you know, that that train's still on that track, you know, based upon, you know, the fact that there's still three to four months left in your fiscal year, you know, the fact that a lot of things can happen, you know, for sure. And uh, and again, just the busyness of the city. So thanks. Other questions. So I have a, <clears throat> I have a couple of questions. Um, well, but just, first of all, um, it's just wonderful to, to know that we're on track, that we're going the right direction, that that to have a, an unmodified uh, opinion uh, on it's great, uh, and also uh, you know having the benchmarks of you know that the goal is to have 60 days worth of operating budget. That's that's you know useful um, or uh, like a, a way to think about it, and knowing that we have 45 days, which is up from um, last year. That's that's great. Um, you know, thinking about kind of coming back to the question that uh, Dan had. Uh, about the infrastructure. So knowing that thinking about the funding for our infrastructure might be a focal point for next year, um, it, it's, it's just very interesting. I just want to make a note that uh, we are, with uh, this budget that we just approved, that'll be voted on town meeting day, so it's the FY21 budget, um, is, marks the end of a long process that um, we, we went through as a council to try to increase the amount of uh, funding that we put into our infrastructure to be maintaining uh, the infrastructure that we had at an appropriate level. So, you know, what, uh, like how much, how much money would be needed to keep, uh, you know, pavement conditions uh, at, a, at a certain uh, functional level over time with proper maintenance and, and whatnot. Uh, and, so anyway, it's just very interesting to hear you say that perhaps um, that the inf that the amount of money that would be needed to maintain the infrastructure is not is uh, per perhaps not enough. Um, and so I'm curious if that uh, thought comes from uh, comparing Montpelier with other municipalities that you might have worked with in terms of like the amount of um, money that. Uh, well, I, I guess I'll just leave it there as a question. Um, what, how how um, for, like, how did you come to that conclusion? Like, what are the what are the ingredients that that go into that? Or and like, how can we be 
thinking about infrastructure differently. So yes, <laughs> I'm going to go back to your question. Yeah. Uh, it is comparing you to other municipalities, and, and and I would add just to that element, 30 years of being me, you know, and dealing with this industry and just going through the the peaks and valleys of the industry and and seeing this change, you know, now and just seeing, you know, really the direction that government's moving in, you know, and I think it moves in a different direction every year, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. So so yes, you know, with as far as the industry and just my knowledge of it, you know, and uh, and just my observations, you know, and some of the conversations, you know, that we had with your management. You know, there's been some deferred maintenance clearly here in Montpelier, and I'd say you're you're going to pay for that now. You're going to pay for that in the future. And winters aren't getting any easier, you know, and, uh, you know, and I would argue, you know, that uh, the snow coming from Vermont, you know, the, the, the snow may hit the roads. I'm not sure the snow is causing the problem. I think it's the salt, the calcium and everything else that's going on the roads, you know, and the potholes that you get and everything. Roads is just probably the biggest infrastructure need, you know, that we see. And being the capital of this great state and seeing the amount of cars, you know, that are probably coming down Route 2 to go to uh, Burlington or come back home, um, that puts wear and tear and stress certainly on your infrastructure as well. You know, so uh, all those, you know, considering I think that there's just a multitude of things, you know, that really force you every year to look at your blueprint. Thank you. Any other questions? Great. Well, thank you, and uh, thank you all for all your, for your work in this. Uh, it's really encouraging to have a, a clean audit. Yeah. So thank you again. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Okay, and so now we are uh, jumping to uh, what was scheduled to be item 10, uh, the Combined Heat and Power Project contract. And I know there are some folks here for that. I'd love to um, invite do you. Do you need a minute? You're good? Okay. <laughs> Welcome. Um, so on your council agenda. Um, oh, do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Kurt Modica, um, City Engineer, Public Works Department. This is Chris Cox, Chief Operator of the Water Resource Recovery Facility. And we're here to um, talk about the agreement uh, for the phase two project at the water resource recovery facility for combined heat and power. Um, we sent a draft agreement around um, in your uh, council packets. Um, just some of the highlights of some uh, of the items we talked about at the last meeting. Um, we are uh, moving forward. Um, we propose to move forward with a single 400 watt uh, kilowatt generator. Um, uh, according to our consultant, that really is the uh, most economical um, option at this point. Uh, moving to two generators would be a cash negative uh, option. Um, but we have set the contract up to allow for a second generator to be installed in the future. So the, the gas conditioning equipment will be sized in a way that um, it can treat all the methane that's produced from the plant, um, which is the big cost of, um, you know, of an adder project to put a second generator in. Um, <clears throat> but at this point, we think that uh, the single generator is the best option. Um, the I also wanted to point out to council that um, there is a risk moving forward with this PDA, a financial risk. Um, we have to essentially um, put forth um, approximately $220,000 to apply for the standard offer program and to do the upfront permitting uh, in order to um, make this project eligible for the, uh, the high, relatively high 20, 20.8 cent um, per kilowatt rate. So there is a risk. So if you do approve this, and there's no absolute guarantee that we will get awarded that. Um, based on conversations with Vepi, we think there is a very good chance that we would get the award. But um, but I just wanted to make sure that the council is aware of that. Uh, ESG did offer to the, the total permit fees are $40,000 approximately. And that includes an air quality permit and the interconnection agreement with Green Mountain Power. And ESG has agreed to take t half of that risk, uh, twenty thousand dollars. Energy Systems Group is ESG, the the contractor we're working with. Um, so instead of a two hundred forty thousand dollar risk, it's a two hundred twenty thousand dollar risk because the um, the agreement itself, the work for ESG to develop the engineering needed um, to do this project, is a cost of two hundred thousand. 
Um, so that is really the highlights of, of what's changed. We are um, still doing final negotiations on this agreement. There may be some minor changes between the two um, lawyers, our attorneys. Um, but I think this is very close. And um, I don't believe there will be any uh, substantial changes to the document. Jack. Kurt, has there, has there been any uh, change in your estimate of the likelihood of, uh, of being able to get the uh, standard offer contract since the last time we talked? Um, no, I have a call into VEPI. I was not able to um, speak with them yet. Uh, it is something I want to chat with them about before we um, have Bill sign this, if, assuming council authorizes it. I don't have any change since last time. I still believe it is a very high likelihood of award, um, but I do want to follow up with the VEPI program. Um, it's still on my list of things to do. Yeah. Great, thanks. Lauren. On that point, so if we did not get it, how would things play out from there? I mean, it sounds very encouraging and mm -hmm. hopeful and optimistic, but <laughs> what, yeah. what would be the kind of plan B or what? All right, so the, um, we'd have the engineering work done. The city would, um, you know, own basically the engineering that to date, so we'd be able to use that to apply with the SG the next year on the standard offer program. So we would go back again. It would be a year delay. A year. Correct, yep. Connor. Which attorneys are we working with on our end on this? They, they always have the question, you know. Uh, Joe McLean with uh, Sitzel, Page, and Fletcher. Okay. I have a whole bunch of questions. Um, to be fair, um, I don't necessarily, I meant to send them to you earlier and I just didn't get to doing that. But um, so I may send you some questions um, later on that are not necessarily like things we have to go into right now. Um, like, let's remove as many acronyms as we can. Um, you know, for example, like PLC, that as an educator, that means something totally different than I'm sure what it means to you. Um, you know, things like that. But um, there are a couple of questions that I have. Um, that I think uh, that I that I want to bring up uh, at this point. Uh, one is that I just want to note that the I mean this is this is clearly a, a, a PDA that ESG is used to working with that they've come up with um, and it has a lot of protections for them. I just want to make sure that we have some protections for us, and those in my mind include um, just some. Uh, uh, specifications about warranties. Uh, so uh, I know it, it does discuss warranties a little bit in this, but um, supposing anything, um, you know, fail. Like, are the like, what if a warranty is only like one year long, um, and you know, we're depending on on that uh, that piece, and then is you know, I, I would just love uh, to have some kind of assurance that. If the warranties are shorter than the term um, of the contract with ESG, that they would end up covering um, something like that. Um, so, just want to make a note about that. Um, second thing is, I think it's a little confusing um, that they're guaranteeing 50% of the uh, feed stock by volume. Um, and specifically, I, I just think that that term by volume is, could be clearer, which is to say, um, is it is it by volume of what is um, considered the capacity of the digester or of the plant? Or is it 50% of um, what is taken in, um, in general, of like just whatever comes to the plant? Um, and so um, presumably uh, the city or, you know, the, uh, you know, the, our, just our staff will be responsible for finding the other 50%. Is that, is that correct? Well, actually, or, that, or is it operating at 50%? Yeah. This particular item is something that ESG has ex actually asked to remove from this agreement, the 50% okay. um, feedstock volume. So the reason is in order to qualify for the VEPI program, you have to have a 50% like food waste uh, going to the digesters. Um, so that actually will go into uh, this. There will be a second contract, assuming we get the award and the interconnection agreement will be a, an actual construction contract with ESG, a design build contract that will include that 50% um, feedstock volume as well as the warranty items that you mentioned. So this is really just kind of um, the precursor till we get the project and then there'll be a much length, more lengthy agreement okay. that will cover those things. Okay. Um, 
Uh, that's good to know because the, the food residuals part was also confusing to me, knowing that I, I feel like we had talked about other types of, uh, you know, fluid, uh, you know, feedstock that was that would not necessarily have been food. Um, so that um, makes, is that is that in, in line sort of where we're still at? It might not, it's just organic material. It's not necessarily food stock, food residuals. Right, and there's a classification through VEPI that kind of defines okay. what's eligible under their program for okay. that uh, standard offer program. Okay, um, and uh, uh, just a, a couple of uh, questions about uh, confidentiality. I just want to make sure that we get to keep the records that um, that. We, that we need, you know, if we have data, um, that like that, the fact that it said, you know, they would be collecting back all of the, um, well, well, some of the information that would be considered confidential. I just want to make sure that we have the, our own uh, records to to be able to track things uh, well for ourselves. I mean, I understand that there's probably some, um, you know, uh, things that do need to be confidential, but um, just um, just flagging that. Uh, and then uh, I just wanted to note that in uh, in this uh, uh, development agreement, um, there was a section. Uh, oh gosh, it is uh, four section four C and D. I just wanted to note that that I. I mean, I can talk to you about C and D offline. It was, it, I just found it a little um, confusing. So I'll ask you about that later. Okay, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I guess that is it for me. So uh, Dan. I had a couple of questions. You know, in, in uh, Exhibit A, I mean, I, at least the form I got, it, it didn't have the engineering drawings and designs and warranties and you indicated that that's going to come with effectively the next phase is it your understanding then that if there's an issue at that phase where we can't come to an agreement or you can't come to agreement with uh with esg that we'd have no further we, we'd be able to to end end the agreement and end any obligations for further payments Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, so essentially, this is sort of an umbrella agreement setting out the framework that um, eventually will be flushed out by these additional documents and these additional agreements as we go along. Um, and then I had a question on the, um, and just that was somewhat of a rhetorical statement, but <laughs> it actually was a question just to make sure I'm right. understanding this correctly. Right, this document is just enough um, work to apply for the standard offer program and to do the engineering work needed for the interconnection agreement with Green Mountain Power, okay. which is required for the application, but it does not include the full design for the generator and all the electrical on the facility, at the facility itself. But it anticipates those? It anticipates that, assuming we get the uh, this award, yeah. Okay. Um, and, and so ESG wants to remove the 50% food volume residual? Right from this from this phase from the, of the contract, they feel it's more appropriate to have in the second um, the actual construction contract, the design build. Okay, but I mean, isn't that something that we would have to essentially prove or represent to uh, Vepi for to, the application? Uh, for the application, right? They feel com comfortable that they can meet that. They just don't feel that this is the appropriate location to put that requirement in. So they want to put it in the latter document as a way. Um, when they actually get around to the design of that, right? Just as part of the, it's part of the guarantee process. So the um, actual construction contract will include all the guarantees, all the warranties. Okay. And that's really part of this um, the meeting that uh, food stock requirement is really a function of that of, of a mm -hmm. guarantee in the contract. Okay, and and you, you you said this is the product so far of some negotiations with Joe and. And the um, attorney for ESG. Correct. Okay. Um, so I was looking at the confidentiality and the public records component. Um, so my understanding is that the there will be some documents that will be considered trade secrets and will be held confidential. And 
so it's my understanding that these would be designated by ESG as confidential trade secrets, but it looks as if that that would expire after one year um, following after the agreement expired or the lifetime of that. Is that? Um, they essentially have like a, a one year non-compete clause where we wouldn't go with another firm to develop a, you know, a power sale agreement mm -hmm. for one year. I believe the confidential confidentiality piece is has to do more with their um, contract language. Um, okay. So, so rather than the technical specs and the specifications, it's more of their bidding and pricing. Correct. Okay. That's. I think that's all I had on my notes. So, thank you. You're welcome. Any further questions? And this will be reviewed by our lawyer before we uh, sign anything. Correct. Yes. Yeah. I'm just asking for you to authorize um, authorize this bill as the designated representative for the city to sign upon final review and approval by the city attorney. Is there a motion? Jack. I move that we authorize the city manager to execute the project development agreement with ESG for phase two of the water resource recovery facility, Second. subject to final review and acceptance by the state city attorney. Second. Okay, uh, so motion and a second. Uh, further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, great. Thank you so much. Yes. All right, and we are going to go right into uh, uh, item, what is listed as item 11, um, discussion of uh, PFAS at the Water Resource Recovery Facility. Um, sorry, yeah. question? Oh, we have the okay. state representatives here, too. Right. Oh, so, okay. yeah, a few okay. uh, folks from DC have come <laughs> to speak on this topic as well. So, okay. invite them up to join awesome. us. Awesome. Welcome. To get more seats. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Empty the room. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. If you wouldn't mind um, passing around the mic as you introduce yourselves. Okay. Uh, I'm Kurt Modica, City Engineer of Public Works. We'll start off again. Casey Caffin with Waste Management Solid Waste Program. Hi, I'm Chuck Schwer. I'm the director of our Waste Management Prevention Division. I've also been fairly active in this whole PFAS issue since 2006. So we decided to bring all our experts to make sure you got all your questions answered. So sorry we're overwhelming you with people, but we want to make sure we help you out. I'm Amy Palachek. I'm the Wastewater Program Manager. Uh, Chris Cox, Chief Operator. I'm Nick Giannetti. I work in the pretreatment section of the Wastewater Program. Hi, my name is Eamon Tuig, and I work in the Residuals Management and Emerging Contaminants Program. All right. So this discussion was instigated um, by an article recently in Vermont Digger that um, discussed PFAS at the wastewater treatment facility. And um, Chris and I put together a memo sort of outlining what PFAS is. It's um, really an emerging contaminant. I think um, the state could attest to we're still doing a lot of sampling and try to get a handle on where things are with it. Um, there is no uh, discharge limit in Vermont for surface water. Um, so really what I, our intention here was to provide an opportunity to answer questions. We've got whole lot of expertise here with the state of Vermont, which we really appreciate them um, coming tonight. Um, but, um, you know, basically uh, the limits uh, from the plant are parts per trillion. So those are um, the, the levels from uh, the drinking water standard is 20 parts per trillion. Uh, our plant, I think, based on the most recent sampling from the state, was around an average of 70 parts per trillion. 
Uh, the EPA standard for drinking water is, is at 70, so we're right around the actual drinking water standard for, uh, as established by EPA, but Vermont has a, a lower one. Um, so I, I think we really covered most of the information in the memo, so I really just was thinking of opening it up to questions uh, f from council on this. Uh, Kurt, real quick, yeah. um, just for the folks who are watching at home, just so we can level the playing field a little bit, sure. um, for those who didn't read the memo, can you explain a little bit about what we're talking about? just other than it being a emerging contaminant? Right. Thank you. Um, so PFAS is a um, many different contaminants. Maybe I should turn this over to the state because they have more expertise than I do. Here we go. What do you want to speak to this? I Summary? can keep just an overview yeah. if that's good, and then I'll ask you guys to jump in. <laughs> So again, when we discovered the problem in Bennington, it was the ChemFab facility. It's a, a compound that's used to uh, acts as a surfactant for Teflon coating, and it was first discovered as an issue in Bennington, 350-odd wells contaminated. Subsequent to that, the question was raised by the legislature, by the public, by cities, you know, where else is this stuff, and, and where should we be concerned about? So we began a two to three year, it's actually almost four years now, sampling program, and most recently we uh, submitted a number of reports that kind of culminated all this work. Some was asked for by the legislature, uh, some was directed, uh, or some was uh, chosen to be done by us to see um, if we could learn more about this contaminant. So from that report, we found that landfill leachate is a considerable source of PFAS in the environment. We also did a study, which Casey can definitely answer much better than I, but uh, materials deposited in the landfill turn out to be the source. A lot of residential, like carpets, furniture, textiles, uh, other clothing type products. So we're all contributing to the source of PFAS that ends up in the final resting area, the landfill, and then the leachate, it accumulates. So in the testing, we did eight different rounds of testing of both the leachate and the wastewater treatment facilities that accept it. And uh, the levels reported are accurate. Coming out the effluent is about 70 parts per trillion. Uh, in developing this program, we did initial calculations of what would be an impact on streams, and our guideline levels were much higher than what um, Montpelier is accepting in leachate. So that was the good news. But what we don't know, and uh, Amy and Nick can talk more about that, is, okay, we know from just testing in the stream that we're not detecting it, but is it a problem for long-term loading of these compounds? Are they accumulating in fish? Is there issues with aquatic biota? We don't know that, and that's something that the state and we hope EPA will help us figure out over the next few years. But really the good news is the, the leachate that Montpelier's accepting is well below those initial guideline levels that we came up with. Again, we're not saying that's the end of the story. There's certainly a lot more we need to learn, but at least initially, we're not thinking it's you know uh, an acute problem, a huge problem at this point. I don't know if any of you guys want to add to that. Thank you. Okay. Questions? Uh, Connor, then Donna, and then Dan, and then Lauren. <laughs> Uh, so just like um, looking at some of the uh, adverse human health impacts of this, and you know, uh, DC will be working with the EPA to see if anything happens in fish or wildlife, right? Do you contract with an epidemiologist to see if there's any instances of sort of the things listed in this memo uh, that are kind of out of whack with just the general population in these areas? Well, to, to come up with our standards. If you wouldn't mind. Um, <clears throat> so to come up with the water quality standards, we work with state toxicologists and we have water quality chemists, you know, in the DEC. So we have, we work with people that are, you know, qualified to assess, um, you know, toxicity in, in humans and aquatic biota and in fish and in surface waters. There, 
nationally there are uh, considerable data gaps though and so that's something that holds back both Vermont and the EPA from being able to make faster progress on standards since it takes a long time to make things evident enough or sick enough to then say oh this is a, a real problem what's our prevention mode assuming it is going to be a problem um, that's a great question. So, um, well, right now, right now, like we we have a standard for drinking water and groundwater, which is 20 parts per trillion. So, we for f five of the 4,000 PFAS compounds. So, we know what safe levels of drinking water are. Um, but for for surface waters and for fish consumption, like we've been saying, we need to collect more data and do more research on that. Um, I think one of the things that we advocate for since there needs to be more research done is source reduction. So going upstream, going to um, where these compounds are coming from and reducing them at the source because we, what we've seen working with New Hampshire, the Mass DEP, um, the EPA, is that that's the cheapest way and most effective way to reduce um, these contaminants. So that's, that's what we would recommend when, when you know, in, in lack of a standard. Okay, so going back to the source, when you talked earlier, he mentioned furniture, carpets, clothing. So that means we have to have higher standards of manufacturing? Yeah, I mean, the things coming into the landfill is a difficult issue to, to pin down. I can speak to doing source reduction of um, sources of wastewater, so folks are, um, you know, I can, I can speak to how to reduce PFAS concentrations in wastewater, right? And so we look at um, industries that are using these products and these products are getting, um, you know, flushed down the drain with their processed wastewater. Um, and, you know, we would look at alternatives of products that they can use to reduce these concentrations. We would look at alternative practices that they could be doing to reduce these concentrations. Um, but as far as reducing the, um, amount of PFAS going to the landfill. Casey, do you want to speak on that a little bit? I, so for the, the sources going into the you landfill. You can speak in the mic. I'm <laughs> back, so okay. I am addressing you. <laughs> um, for the sources going into the landfill, we looked at sources that were probable to have PFAS to start with. And so it was sludges, um, as was mentioned, textiles, uh, soils that were contaminated for other reasons. We tried to do a, a broad sweep of material types that are going to the landfill but are also in use around. Um, and as Chuck mentioned, the highest amount of PFAS that ends up in the landfill, so on a, a mass basis, our estimate is that it's coming from bulky furniture, couches, carpets, um, other textile sources like clothing, um, Umbrellas were really, really high. We looked at a, a very broad range of materials. Um, and so in terms of trying to reduce what's the, the amount of PFAS that's going into the landfill, addressing those um, sources that are industrial in nature sl or sludges, things of that type, certainly would help, but it's not going to cut off the beast. Um, and so that needs to be done at a, a broader level, and a broader level than Vermont, even. Um, and, you know, I think even if that were to happen and we were to get rid of PFAS out of all materials, we're still going to have to deal with this because we're going to have that residual legacy product at our landfills and at our wastewater facilities. And that's why we're doing this sampling is to try and get a sense of, of what that looks like. Thank you. Dan. Sorry, this is uh, maybe PFAS for dummies for me. Um, so if I understand correctly, the the PFAS is coming from the source materials that then gets trucked as part of the sludge or wastewater leachate material that is treated by the treatment plant. And there's nothing the wastewater treatment plant can do to remove that. It's just in the water. It's going to go through the system and come out on the other side. So there's no part of the solution that necessarily uh, you know, and, and I'll use a really simple idea of like a filter um, that's going to change that. Well, 
Um, the standard wastewater treatment, biological treatment that is usually used by wastewater treatment plants does not re the, remove these type of chemicals. Mm -hmm. However, there are treatment processes that can remove them, granular activated carbon, um, reverse osmosis, but they're very expensive. And so that's the issue with these type of chemicals. Also, once you have your granular activated carbon that's been spent, the issue is where do you take that? Right. Because now it's full of PFAS. Okay. So just in under, so I mean, part of it is that, you know, we have, the, so there is a way of possibly filtering, but it's expensive and it's, it, it sounds like it has to be a state and sort of federal answer. And the other part is that we don't even know what this necessarily does downriver. It, or how how much it accumulates i mean is there any sense about whether it accumulates in like the sediment or the the river bottom itself um as opposed to the the aquatic biota and fish populations um so i'm gonna i'm gonna tackle that kind of in two parts I'm, I'm gonna back up to the, the treatment discussion mm -hmm. just a, a little bit um so treatment of pfas is definitely possible um on the landfill side, because the source of PFAS going into your wastewater facility, uh, the landfill certainly is um, contributing quite high concentrations. There's, there's no denying that. Right. Um, we are exploring treatment options with the landfill. We did have them prepare a report looking at how they could treat their leachate. And that is the same treatment process that could be used on any liquid. Uh, so if you're interested in looking at that more, um, we're working through that process with the landfill. The, the problem is not only the costs, but there's still some pretty big unknowns associated with treatment of PFAS. So we, we have the, the granulated activated carbon or, or something that holds onto the PFAS. It's captured it. We've got to do something with it. Um, and on, on a broad scale, that stabilization or destruction of PFAS um, is complicated and unknown at this time. So, you know, it, it's not even just a matter of the cost, it's a matter of making sure that we take the time to explore our best options. And right. whether that's at the treating the leachate or working with the wastewater facilities. Right, um, or a yucca mountain for, uh, for carbon, PFAS. For PFAS, yeah. <laughs> 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 And then, and then for the what happens to it in the the aquatic environment, that's exactly the questions that still need to be addressed. It okay. is they are highly soluble compounds, but it is going to partition and separate out into different parts of the the environment. Okay. Thanks. I have a number of questions. Um, I know you're shocked. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, first of all, I just, I do want to acknowledge that DEC and the state has been like a national leader on PFAS response. And when the Bennington um, PFOA contamination was discovered in the drinking water, Vermont stepped up, responded, was, you know, doing a press conference within like 30 minutes of it being found, whereas other states hid it for like years from, you know, their equivalent DECs knew about it. So like big kudos to the state and DEC in particular, who's been like out front on this issue. And it's been incredibly challenging and in trying to catch up with the science and understand what's happening. So like just thank you all for <laughs> the hard work that you've been doing. And it's been a massive effort to try to get a handle on all of it. Um, you know, and this is like in the context of us trying to catch up to the science, and we know that the companies that manufacture these chemicals have known since what, the 50s, 60s that this stuff was super toxic, incredibly persistent, so that's why they're called forever chemicals, because they stay in the environment. So this whole idea that it gets diluted in the water, but we know it, it's, stick, it's sticking around somewhere, and it's accumulating somewhere, and so you know, knowing, just saying like dilution is the solution to pollution is not, not a great choice in this instance and like we don't have a lot of good options so it's very frustrating and we don't have good federal leadership um, on these issues I mean it's been a challenge for decades and this particular EPA is not going to be solving these problems for us um, and so you know trying to struggle with what we do here um, I was curious um, from you all so I know that there's ongoing conversations and there was legislation that asks for development of a surface water standard could you just talk a little bit more about you know, I, I know, again, like that's being out front um, nationally, so there's not a lot of good models, but where does that stand? What's the timeline for that? Where are you seeing that head? Just because that would intersect with what we would then have to meet. 
Sure. So the report on that just came out a few weeks ago, um, at, but I can make a summary here for you. Uh, basically, Act 21 requires the DEC to file a rule for surface water standards by the 1st of January 2024. And uh, there are three or four major recommendations that came out of the report, um, but ANR generally recommends to not develop a Vermont specific criteria at this time due to the data gaps and the costs associated and then the uncertainty associated with those. Um, this is the first time that EPA, or the, I'm sorry, that DEC would develop a water quality criteria for something that the EPA doesn't already have a criteria for. So it puts us out in front of the EPA, as you've mentioned. Um, but the major recommendations were, for the first thing was to establish a human health criteria using fish tissue concentrations. So using uh, the human health criteria expressed in fish tissue and then issuing consumption advisory screening levels rather than a water quality limit, a numeric limit um, in water. And then um, we're going to track the EPA development because their action plan for PFAS is to have an ambient water quality criteria or standard for aquatic life by um, 2022. So I understand that there's a a distrust of what's <laughs> happening in the current administration with the EPA, uh, but looking to them as the federal backstop is important for us because of the the cost and the regulatory uncertainty with creating a standard that would be different than what we would be held to once the federal criteria comes out. Um, so, so, do you are you concerned about our current drinking water standard, which the federal government doesn't have? A drinking water standard yet and ours is more protective no no I so wouldn't say that I'm I, I'm concerned about that that's based on uh, human health and consumption that this is a more complex media and issue um, when you're looking at surface water uh, the last uh, recommendation was for us to continue to collaborate with the region one states and so New England um, e EPA region one and um, also to, um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought, and to, as Nick was saying, source reduction. So those were the major outcomes from that water quality um, development doc, criteria development document. Could, um, just a couple more questions. So could you describe a little, I'm, I'm partly, I mean, I know that there are, it's challenging to even figure out how to filter and you know what works for long chains might not be as good for short chains and all these complicating factors um, what so it looked like there were nine samples taken which is what we're basing this on what kind of monitoring protocol I'm partly interested and in, I think that that we as a council should think about if we're going to continue taking leachate from Casella that maybe they should be paying for an extensive monitoring program so we can get better data and a handle on what is coming out of our facility and start making having some better informed decisions based on good data. I mean, I'm a little surprised that you're not, I mean, I understand stuff goes into the landfill. We all contribute stuff that contains PFAS, but Casella also does have a role here in the fact that they're kind of being let off the hook from anything you're talking about. So just monitoring what could be done there and that, um, and then I was also thinking about um, you know, you talked about how the state, I know there's conversations happening about pretreatment um, of the leachate before it would come somewhere to the Montpelier facility. I think you as a council bless you. Um, should think about if we're going to continue keep taking the leachate that maybe we require that within a year there needs to be a plan for what's happening with that pretreatment. We're not, this shouldn't be on us to do that. We could stop taking the leachate um, or we could put some parameters around our willingness to take it, knowing that we're contributing to this problem. So I just love your thoughts on kind of where that stands, where those conversations are going, you know, understanding this is a huge challenge and there's no easy answers here, but just what your thoughts would be on those kinds of ideas. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll adjust the monitoring component and then maybe pass it over to Nick for the pretreatment stuff Thank discussion. Um, for the monitoring at the landfill, we do require them to monitor the leachate through our solid waste certification with them. And that's been a, an ongoing monitoring uh, program that's been in place since the landfill <clears throat> has been certified. Um, PFAS is a new addition to that. And so we are get going 
forward be getting PFAS results from the, the bulk tank, which is what's going to your wastewater facility, uh, as part of that monitoring report. Um, and, you know, certainly would be, that's available information for anybody, but if we see any significant changes in the PFAS concentrations, we're going to want to be looking at why that's happening in the landfill and then considering the, the implications of that. Um, part of this intensive uh, multi um, event sampling program that we did over a few months period was to try and get at that question of PFAS. Does it fluctuate? Are there sources coming in that make it spike way up? And um, surprisingly to me a little bit, it was pretty stable uh, both at the, the within the landfill leachate and at the wastewater facilities. Um, so, you know, even though there, there may be fluctuations in the sources, there's this kind of um, capacity of the system that's evening things out. So would, could you speak to, just on the monitoring point, um, I mean, developing a monitoring protocol for our own effluent that Casella, I think, should pay for? Um, is, there pro is there any precedent of? Um, there's no precedent that I know of for that, and it, it is not something that Casella currently is doing. I, you know, I think you guys can explore whatever you want, but we do have data available for you to, to base that. Before, yeah, but of what's going into Correct. entering this. Yes. Thank you. I just wanted to add one thing, too, and I think Nick did mention that, but when we looked at the uh, different wastewater treatment facilities, how many did we test? It was we had just over 20 facilities. 20 so facilities. So the ones that didn't take leachate still, have. still had PFAS. Yeah. So even if you eliminate leachate, you're still likely to have PFAS. Certainly it was lower levels. Yeah. As we said, we're not denying the high concentrations of PFAS and leachate, but recognize, I think, the approach that Nick and Amy are talking about by going after sources is really an important first step, and we're absolutely committed to doing that. How quickly we'll see results and how effective is really still uncertain, but that is something the state absolutely knows is the smart and right thing to do. How we stop it from the landfill is a challenge. Uh, Casey's group is working really hard with Casella to try to reduce the amount of leachate that's generated. Also a challenge, but that's something that obviously it's in their best interest to do that. So that's another thing. If we can reduce the volume of leachate, that would also be an advantage. Mm -hmm. um, Jack and then Dan, unless there was more comments, yeah. Okay. I, was just, I was just going to speak to the pre-treatment permit quickly. Um, so I wouldn't say Casella is totally off the hook um, with uh, regulating PFAS. I mean, right now, um, so the state the state authorizes Casella to discharge leachate to the Montpelier Wastewater Treatment Facility, um, a Burlington Wastewater Treatment Facility, Essex Junction, um, Barry, and maybe one more, um, and. Um, that permit is an authorization to, to discharge that. So we're, we're in the process of renewing that permit, which um, we're considering the, the study that Casella did looking at treatment alternatives for PFAS. And we're considering all this monitoring data that we have for PFAS concentrations in leachate and PFAS concentrations at wastewater treatment facilities in residuals and sludge and in effluent. And we'll make a decision when we um, issue the permit as to whether or not Casella needs to perform routine monitoring of PFAS and or treatment of, of PFAS and, and other emerging contaminants using this data that we've gathered. Uh, one difficult part in all of this is the lack of a published standard. Um, it makes regulating and giving limits on certain contaminants really difficult when we don't have a, a published standard. So there are a few ways that we're looking at um, to see whether or not there's, there's a workaround for that. But um, we are considering um, regulating PFAS in, in leachate. Thanks, that's helpful. Um, and from like reading the report Casella did, I mean, it seemed like pretreatment on site is a is a choice. It's expensive, so they don't recommend it. Understandably, they say places like Montpelier should pay for it instead, or do it and do a cost sharing or something. Um, but you know, obviously, they have their own study. They have their own financial interest in. Yeah, I mean, in the recommendations that they 
but yeah, I mean, it, it is expensive and somewhere it's gotta be paid for. You know, if, if their permit didn't allow them to discharge PFAS above X levels, it wouldn't be a choice. You know, obviously they'd have to, you know, they would have an opportunity to appeal that permit, which goes back to the standard, right? Like, that's why it's important to have um, your permit limits based on, you know, like standards and, you know, regulations, right? So they're defensible. But um, so it's, it's a challenging issue, but it's something that we are considering. And like I said, we're looking at a few different, um, you know, we're, we're going to be considering it in the renewal, which... Um, is coming up pretty soon. They just um, released that um, study looking at the treatment alternatives. Um, we're working with a third party consultant to review that study because um, we're all very knowledgeable in PFAS, but we're not industry experts. Um, so uh, we've, uh, we're, it, we sent out an RFP and um, we've received some proposals back and I'm not sure if has the, has it been awarded yet? Yeah. Yes, we've awarded um, our, this contract to a third-party consultant who um, is qualified in, in PFAS and emerging contaminants in leachate, and they'll, they'll review that study and make sure Casella, um, we've asked them to look at you know, the costs that Casella used and the assumptions that Casella used and um, evaluate whether or not Casella missed anything. You know, is there something else out there that they omitted or something like that? So, so we're going to get that report, and then um, then we'll make a permitting decision. Thank you. Jack, what, go ahead. Uh, what Lauren was talking about was just what where my mind is going too. You know, you said, well, you don't want to have a Vermont standard because there's uh, in some hopefully finite number of years there will be a federal standard established. I'm. Uh, it's kind of an interesting question of um, economics and regulation. If there's no state, if there's no standard for anyone, then Montpelier could say, "Well, we're not going to take it unless you either reduce the level uh, in the leachate or pay us for the carbon or reverse osmosis systems." And I can imagine some other plant that they could be going to might say, "Well." We'll just underbid Montpelier by not requiring them to pay for that, and and so regulation is is vital here. And uh, I don't know how to anticipate what's uh, what's going to come out of the EPA, but uh, it's, it's it strikes me as a serious problem that uh, if if one actor goes it alone. And, and we decide, well, we're going to be the most environmentally responsible <coughs> uh, plant. We, uh, we say, no, you're not going to do that unless they say, well, fine, we'll, we'll take the, we'll all the, the we take, we'll take our revenue that we're paying you and send it somewhere else. Maybe upstream of us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so is there any system in place such that if the levels, the PFAS level should spike and go particularly high such that it would create a danger if it was discharged in surface water, that we would be alerted to that? Um, yeah. <laughs> um, <we're> <laughs> <laughs> uh, so our monitoring program is is not daily. It's, it's semi-annual um, from a mixed tank that is both old leachate from older portions of the cell and newer leachate. So mm -hmm. the, the older portions, I don't think, are going to fluctuate significantly. The newer stuff is where the uncertainty is. And, right. and we do not currently monitor on a level to address that uncertainty. With that said, what we've seen for concentrations to date, the, the guidelines that, that Chuck was referring to in terms of, of if the leachate were to pass straight through the wastewater facility with no dilution and come out at the end of the pipe, mm -hmm. um, that we were, um, the, the guidelines that we were comfortable with at this point in time based off of what we know um, are orders of magnitude higher than what we've seen. Uh, so for, for PFOA, one of the compounds that these guidelines were established, it was 120,000 PPT. What we're seeing is around 1,000 to 2,000 PPT. So for, um, and, and similarly for the other compound, um, so for a, a spike to be at a level that 
would cause immediate acute concern for us mm -hmm. right now. Um, it would have to be a very significant change in the system, either at the landfill or within the wastewater facility. And I think we all have an open line of communication that right. we should know what that change would be if something were to happen <coughs> before seeing it in the PFAS results. Okay, but there is no sort of formal. It would be more someone would happen to uh, look at this and maybe feel uh, motivated to call as opposed to required? Uh, for the PFAS concentrations, yes. yes, but we are monitoring lots of other components of the landfill and the wastewater facility. Um, so I, I guess what I'm trying to say is sure. there's other things that would um, trigger us to look at PFAS. So it's likely that the PFAS wouldn't necessarily be the sole spiking uh, concentration level, that there'd be other, other There would be flags. something making it spike okay. up to a, a level that would... Um, and then I had a, a second question. Uh, it's, uh, thanks for that. I, I think I understand that. Um, and I think, you know, from our perspective, it may be something we want to revisit when we revisit our contract with Casella. But along those lines, and knowing that there's a certain desire not to have a standard that is going to be out in front before the EPA gets there or even the region gets there. Uh, has there been any thought to having the various facilities such as Montpelier, Newport, Barrie um, work together with you to sort of set some basic <laughs> framework for this? Because it strikes me that, you know, what Jack and, and Lauren's concern that, you know, if, if we do all of a sudden create this, this standard that it, it becomes economically easier for them to truck it to New Hampshire or, or somewhere else, it strikes me that there's a balance point, too, where you can impose some sort of control if the current recipients of this leachate would work together with you. And you would seem, the state would seem to be the logical nexus point to have that where, you know, there might be some controls that would be short of standards or guidelines that would be the sort of legally binding components that you don't necessarily want to get in front of, but that we would work with you and with Barry and with Newport to say, well, okay, these are the threshold things we need, such as a monitoring system with regular intervals for this type of testing. And we can agree that if it goes beyond this level, we need to be warned and it needs to be action taken or even looking towards, well, if the EPA doesn't move, we need to think about treatment such that it, it's more of a partnership kind of, you know, it's, it's the slow boil of regulation rather than the, the quick Im imposition. Uh, is there anything in the process for that or willingness to sort of have us come into that sort of collective action? So um, I think the pretreatment permit is an opportunity to have that conversation. Okay. Um, and I envision, you know, maybe monitoring of, of PFAS is, is an option as you know who pays for that monitoring I, i'm i'm not sure how, right. how that would work out but another option you have is using the provisions in your sewer use ordinance to require um you know casella to pay for right well no i know. mean I, under, I understand that we can do stuff individually we can even work with them in, in our contract and I, you know part of it too is i should say i mean it's not as if casella is creating these pfas they're just the oh, ones yeah. who get right. dumped first uh, on them um, you know they're at the they're at the top of the hill and it's flowing down. Um, so it's but it's a matter of okay if we have to deal with this you know what's the sort of collective way of dealing with this? And you said the the permits in process yeah, being so renewed. We're gonna be yeah we're gonna be renewing that permit um, this spring early summer. That's so I mean does it make any goal. sense to have you know representatives of these various say Kurt or somebody who can meet with you and oh yeah you know. there will and okay. that's typically that's that's how the process goes I mean the Vermont's one of the only states where the state issues these types of permits normally it's the municipality that issues these permits but right. in our case I'm the lucky person that gets to issue all of them <laughs> and uh, yeah you know typically how it goes is I meet with the municipality in this case municipalities mm -hmm. that are being affected or that are receiving the industrial discharge and we discuss, you know, what sort of monitoring requirements are necessary, what sort of limits are necessary, and um, 
what sort of best management practices, treatment, et cetera, are necessary for the permit to protect the plant's operations, to protect um, sludge quality so that the plant can dispose of their residuals, to protect surface waters, and to protect worker health and safety too. So, you know, you don't want industries discharging toxic fumes into the collection system, sure. stuff like that. So, yeah, we sit down with the municipality and we, we figure out all of that. Um, I will say, though, that it needs to be defensible. Sure. No, I understand. It can't just be arbitrary and capricious. And yeah. I've certainly uh, challenged the ANR on such things before. <laughs> yeah. Um, and one, but no. Um, uh, <laughs> 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 Sorry. Um, anyway. Um, <clears throat> if I could follow up on that point for just a minute. You know, you know, by it, winning and against Dan <laughs> no, no, no. I, I'm happy to hear that, but no. But I, it, not to get all legal and everything, but if I were the lawyer for a landfill operator, I would say when you're talking about collective action by a number of <coughs> participants in a market, another name for that is antitrust. <laughs> and so that I could see that as a way of uh, that someone would, would challenge it if, uh, if it's not based on some uh, regulation that can be shown to be valid. Right. Dan, did you have anything further? No, I just, I, I think I understand and I, I think that, that that makes sense to um, to go forward. And if you're already working with, with Kurt and others and sort of setting some of these standards, that's, and, and understanding that do, they do have to be defensible. They do have to be standards that are rooted in some authority that you have as well as some cognizable standard. So um, that's all. Jack, did you have anything further? No. Uh, Donna. So I'd like to build on that conversation and ask, instead of looking at as a rule, how about a round table of municipals, landfills, and the state and doing best practices, recommendations, very strongly on the high of prevention, prevention, prevention. Mm -hmm. uh, because even when you're talking in the memo that I believe Kurt sent us, he says that leachate comes from all landfills have it. And yet someone else said when you were testing 20, some had the PFAS and some didn't have leachate. Did I misunderstand what you said? <laughs> she can clean it up for me. <laughs> um, so I, I think we did hit a disconnect there. So all landfills do produce leachate. Okay. Um, um, all, all landfills produce leachate. Okay, great. <laughs> okay. We do only have a handful that are line landfills that have collection systems here in Vermont. Oh, okay. And so we have five of those. The, the 20 facilities that we were referring to are wastewater facilities that were sampled. And all okay. the wastewater facilities also had PFAS within their influence and effluence. Okay. Okay. Even the so, ones that didn't take leachates. Correct. Yes. Okay. Yes. And likewise, now I'm disturbed because it says it was test, you tested it in two eight, 2018, and it was at 10, and it jumped to 69 point, which you're all rounding off to 70. Now, to me, that's like in one year's time, it went from a 10 to a 70. Now, that's concerned. And yet, you said from the time now, you feel it's steady. So help me understand that. Yep. <laughs> So I think the issue was the number of samples. The, the first study only, I think, was just one or two samples, very, very small number of sample points, whereas the second study had a total of nine points, I believe. So you get a much better representative sample of what's actually happening in the effluent. So it just wasn't enough data points. And even nine is you know, a fairly small amount to really get a true uh, representative sample of what's happening. So I think. And I think, too, uh, yep. part of this might be, and I haven't looked at the that 2018 data in a little bit. Um, but we were looking at two compounds at that point in time, and now we're looking at five. Um, for our, That's our, our health advisory, and so that's what we were tallying. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't know what that 2018 sum of the five would be, but I think it's closer to the... So the um, same term the, was the used, even though one had five elements in Right, our, our health advisory changed during okay. that timeline, okay. and that's... That's the only thing we have to compare to right now, so that's what we're using kind of as our I think 70 is too many. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Glenn. I don't think it jumped up. I think it's just okay. a okay. comparison. And just to follow up on that last point, um, 
that the, the standards change to add more individual chemicals to the same standard, uh, there are more chemicals that could be added, yes? So is that something we should be concerned about? I think earlier there was some, a point in the conversation when uh, it was stated that you know the, the class of these chemicals is thousands, and we are testing for a very small number of those currently. We really don't have a good answer. That's an absolutely great point, and we recognize it. The legislature did ask us to look at a way to regulate PFAS as a class. Uh, it's done in other contaminants, like PCBs. You can measure for one of the aerochlores and know that if it's at that level, you can be comfortable. But I think we just don't know so much about these 4,000-plus chemicals that we think it's really certainly really hard for Vermont to do that. There is uh, pressure for EPA to look at that, but still I don't think the science is out there. But we're looking for how many now? We, 24. 24. So we're looking at 24 of 4,000. And our health department toxicologist is looking at those. There's not a lot of health-based data for those. So um, we really can't answer that question, but it's an absolute 100% valid point. Um. I'm going to jump in here. Uh, I have a whole bunch of questions as well. Um, so we've talked about filtration and the possibilities for filtering. I know that they're considered forever chemicals, but um, is there any known way of decomposing PFAS? Science is <laughs> so one thing that we did early in the program is do a take back of firefighting foam that uh, Fire departments around the state had the older foam that had really high concentrations of PFOS, and we got all these compound, uh, all these uh, 2,500 gallons of these pails of firefighting foam, and then we had a fair amount of opposition to, well, what are you going to do with them? Where are you going to take them? And, and the best science says you can incinerate them, that it will destroy it over a certain temperature. That's still under debate. So we were going to use a facility in Ohio that had some issues, and it was uh, brought to our attention, which was actually a very valuable thing that happened. And we ended up taking it, uh, disposing of it at a cement kiln in New York that burned at a higher temperature. But to be honest, we're not 100 percent confident that that destroys 100 percent. But the science, as of today, says a certain temperature will destroy these chemicals. And but a lot more study has to be done to I'm be certain say, of that. Um, I also would be worried about the chemistry of what might be coming out on the other end of the incineration. Um, that could look a whole bunch of different ways, I imagine, and you know, all kinds of other interesting exotic uh, <coughs> results. Um, okay, so that's um, useful. I've also heard that um, pyrolysis can. Uh, also potentially decompose PFOSs, except for that it's effectively also incineration. Um, it's basically the same. I, I mean, I know it's not the same, but um, it's, you know, high temperature, high pressure. Anyway, um, I assume that's also in the, um, if you consider incineration as separate from pyrolysis, that that also would be effective. Yeah, or we don't know. Yeah, we definitely don't know. We've heard from a, a local individual that's very excited about this technology okay. and at this point we just don't have enough information to say yes or no it was not one of the technologies that the casella's report looked okay. at consultant looked at but we could ask our third party to weigh in on that i think i also heard from the same enthusiastic individual um so in terms of uh reducing sources um, you know, I know we, we talked about uh, furniture. Um, I, I thought I read in some of the material ahead of time that uh, these chemical, chemicals have been banned in the United States, or that manufacturing in the United States is not as common now. Is that is that correct? Am I remembering that correctly? Not necessarily banned. There was a voluntary agreement to phase them out, and it was PFOA and PFOS, not some of the other shorter chain. And then we have been learning that some of the replacements can actually break down into PFOA and others. So it's still there. 
Okay. And then also remember when you're throwing out carpet in the landfill, it's probably 10, 20 years old. So, mm -hmm. you know, it was used when, when it was that cool. type of Scotch guard or stain resistant material was used well, in a higher concentration. It's interesting to hear that um, umbrellas, for example, were, um, you know, high concentration source. Um, I mean, it makes me wonder if, you know, knowing that the, the history of this chemical is in affiliation with Teflon, um, then, you know, it makes me think that, like, okay, so umbrellas are kind of shiny, like they're nylon. Does, is there a correlation there with, like, the types of fabrics that one might, um, you know, the, the, I assume, I assume umbrellas or nylon, maybe there's something else, but um, that that type of material, like polyesters, um, synthetic materials like that, that that's the kind of textiles that we're talking about? Uh, I, I think it's more product use. So it, it is a stain resistancy, water repellency, those those okay. types of activities, not necessarily material. Okay, but it, but the function of yes. material that, okay. Yeah. That is interesting and helpful, thanks. Um, and then, so just in terms of th thinking about our uh, uh, water uh, treatment facility, so uh, do, so I assume that we have different tipping fees for leachate versus um, septage. Yep. And I assume it's higher for leachate. It's not. Nope. Okay. Um, how, so as we move forward with monitoring ourselves, how do we have any estimates as to how much we anticipate spending in terms of monitoring um, for PFOSs moving into the future? I mean, so far the the monitoring has been conducted by the state of Vermont. The okay. city hasn't done PFOS monitoring individually to date. Okay, and that does that also occur semi-annually? The PFOS monitoring that we did was kind of like a one-time event where we did nine samples at approximately 20 wastewater treatment facilities across the state, influent, effluent, and, and sludge. Do you anticipate that that would be <coughs> yearly or? No, it was just kind of like a, a one-time one -time event. One-time thing. Yeah, that, that we had money to do the sampling, and then now we have a phase two sampling that's coming up, and we're plant, we're trying to figure out what we want to sample. Some of the things we're considering are um, industrial users connected to the wastewater treatment facility, mm -hmm. um, leachates, um, we're, we're still talking about mm -hmm. what we want to sample using that money. Okay. Um, and when does our contract with Casella come up again for renewal? There is no official contract. There's no official contract. Okay. Nope. Um, so since this is an emerging um, issue, I mean, it, it seems like monitoring moving on in the future would be logical, um, potentially. Uh, and so uh, then the, I feel like the question is going to be, like, whose responsibility is it? I mean, does it continue to be the state's? Fair enough. Um, and then how are, how are you all paying for that? I suppose that's not, not my issue to worry about. Um, but uh, in case, you know, if it does come to the city um, to take on monitoring that, um, I mean, it, it seems like that would be a logical thing to build into the, the tipping fee um, for leachate. Um, and then, but in addition to that, um, you know, as you're considering the, the you know, c uh, approving uh, the pretreatment um, permit. permit, thank you. Um, I mean, I wonder, I, we sort of talked about this a little bit earlier on uh, Dan's comment, but um, just thinking about could a condition of their permit be obligating them to work with uh, treatment sites uh, to share in cost monitoring or to or to you know shoulder the, the cost monitoring uh, or the monitoring costs uh, or um, even anticipating um, some kind of filtration or um, or decomposition you know do we like how or, oh gosh. Anyway, I know, I know there's more research that needs to be done, uh, so there's possibilities there. But just thinking about like how can we, th this seems like an opportunity to say, um, you know, you need to be helping us monitor and um, share the share the burden for monitoring and then potentially treatment. Uh, yeah, and so I, you have something to say, and then Dan, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't envision the permit talking about who
pays for the monitoring mm -hmm. um, or sharing costs associated with the monitoring. Typically, the way the permit works is the permittee is responsible for meeting the requirement and however they meet that requirement, as long as it's you know within our standards, um, is, is how they meet that requirement. So that I can envision something like um, you know, like an agreement or an MOU or something between the town and, and Casella to work out how to pay for, for the monitoring. Um, but the, the permit won't, won't get into cost sharing and, and stuff like that. Okay, thank you. I mean, I, I guess my reaction as far as the monitoring, it seems it's gonna be much more effective by doing it at the source where this leachate is coming from, these tanks, that rather than, um, because after, if we're measuring, if we're monitoring our out, output, it's already out there. Um, whereas if we can install the monitoring before any type, you know, we know what we're receiving or at least have these, these warning signals. But um, it does sound like this is, this is ultimately something that's gonna be resolved by both the permit as well as re our relationship with, with Casella and trying to work out some of those details privately that the permit won't necessarily cover. Great. And Lauren, I know you had something, sorry. Yeah. Um, just, so we've talked about the effluent. What's the sludge situation? Did Montpelier sludge get tested? And then can you remind me what happens? Does that all go back to the landfill? That's correct. Yep. Um, so did Dyer's get tested and what was the result of that? I think Eamon's been pretty quiet all night. Yeah, he's got all right, time. I want to bring you into the fun. All right, here. Yay. <laughs> uh, yeah, we tested um, 22 facilities solids, and I won't get into the complicated nature of what happens to all those solids because it depends on what you, how you treat it and what you do. Um, I don't think Montpelier's was necessarily a lot higher than any of the others, and um, you know currently it is going to the landfill, so that's kind of a closed loop in a way, although that's probably arguable. Um, and you know, other facilities in the state do have various disposal options, but most of about half of it goes to the landfill in the state. And the landfill also takes sludges from out of state, so they take, I would say, three quarters of the sludges they take comes from out of state. So we're not Is that land, right? We're not land applying ours, at least. I, don't know. Um, I just one other. I mean, I guess it was kind of brought up the. Um, worker issues. I don't know if there's any potential like concern of exposure at the facility um, for you all, or if there's any anything that you guys at DEC would be concerned about, um, or considerations that the facility should be thinking about to ensure that our workers are not being exposed. Um, we don't. Yeah, we don't have any concerns regarding that right now. Um, when we talk about worker health and safety, it's mostly like vapor, to like toxicity from like vapors and um, flammable substances and stuff like that. But um, yeah, we don't we don't have any concerns with that right now. We will look into it during the permit renewal. But um, I don't I haven't heard of any other wastewater treatment facility yeah, seeing that as an as okay. an issue. Yeah, I think, I think in these conversations, and I'm, I'm going to speak from a really high level, but I think that you, when we start looking at really low numbers and part per trillions and effluents and things like that, you have to think about also what your relative exposure is and what the real health risks are. Most of us are coming into contact with these materials through household dust and hopefully not through your water. And that's really the state's primary concern is making sure that everybody is drinking clean, safe water. Um, I don't. I know that I drink from Lake Champlain and as a Burlingtonian, but um, and that water is tested and, and so far so good. And I think it's a pretty big dilution factor there. But um, you know, I think the the nature of this compound is very difficult because it can volatilize, it can be in the air, it can be right on the surface of water, it can glean to solids, it likes to stick to certain charges. So it's a very unique compound perfect water repellent, um, all those things. And uh, I would say that it's certainly something to think about. I mean, I think exposure at, at a wastewater plant is, is something to think about. And I think that 
there is likely to be ongoing research in that area in the future. That's probably something to leave for academia and for grants and for funding to figure out if there's an issue. Um, but, but no, I think that, you know, I think we all underestimate that we are exposed to these compounds pretty regularly. And it's usually through your household dust or your, your food packaging or, or things like that, or your coats or things like that. And, um, and, and I, I know we made a report and I know we presented data comparing five compounds to a drinking water standard, but we gotta keep in mind that this is effluent from a wastewater plant, not drinking water. We're not drinking the water from the Minuski. Um, that said, the fish tissue consumption is something that needs to be worked on and it will be. Um, there's a lots of states working on that. Well, not a lot, but there's, there's handfuls of states working on that. And um, whether or not there ends up being fish tissue consumption advisories, it's too early to say, but um, we already have some in place for mercury and things like that at Lake Champlain that are probably already protective enough. One, one other thought. So I'm just thinking about the if there's any risk of liability, the city now knowingly taking in, and even though, you know, at this point levels are low, um, but, you know, all the research that comes out keeps showing lower and lower levels are more toxic, so that's the trend, and knowing that there's the 4,000 chemicals that we're just beginning to understand. Um, so in the kind of precautionary <laughs> model, I just, is, there, is there risk of liability to the city now that we have you know, a memo on record in this conversation of knowing that there's this, um, this toxic chemical that we're you know, releasing? I know there's been a lot of conversations at the State House about medical monitoring for people exposed to toxic chemicals. There was a bill that passed that unfortunately the governor vetoed that exempted municipalities, but now that doesn't exist. And there was a court decision recently that said um, people could go after medical monitoring. So for example, the fish tissue was making me think of it. If somebody fishes, I mean, if you're fishing right outside the wastewater treatment facility, but, and you know, could somebody be exposed and make a case that, that they were exposed and now cities are on the hook because, um, of this court decision and lack of a statute that exempted municipalities. Um, is there any risk that the city is taking on to knowingly continue to do this? And I don't, I, yeah, that's not, I mean, that's not that your, one. that's <laughs> just something. <laughs> <laughs> just, I don't know. And keep in mind, you know, th your wastewater facility is, a, is passing through, right? This, these materials are coming to you and they're, they're passing through. It's, it is somewhat similar to the landfill in a way. There's, they're accepting garbage from everybody in the state and it's passing through the system and it's coming out the other end and we have to do something with it. And it's not a perfect solution, but um, you know, everybody in society is contributing to this problem. And uh, you know, outside of liability, it's, it really is, I, I, I see wastewater treatment plants being referred to as sources and they're really not. The wastewater plant is not adding PFAS in between when it comes to it goes out the back end. So um, that may not speak to liability, but it's a way to look at it. So one thing I don't know if we mentioned, I know it's been in the press, but the state is going after the manufacturers of these chemicals. As Lauren said, there's really solid evidence to show that back in the 50s, 60s, probably even 40s, they knew the stuff was bad. So the idea would be if we were to win and were to get a settlement, we would hopefully create some funds that we could help municipalities, Montpelier being certainly a prime one, deal with this issue. But as we know how lawsuits go, uh, it's probably not gonna be <laughs> anytime soon that we reach that end game. But the state is certainly committed to trying to help us get resources to deal with this problem. Great. Any further questions? Anything else? Um, Donna, go ahead. I just want to you thank you all. You have such you. knowledge, and you've been so open about it. And uh, I hope when you go to your job, realize you're very valuable to us. So <laughs> keep it up. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you so much. I, well, thanks for having all of us, and I'm definitely thank you. proud of, I mean, these guys are doing the work and they really deserve the credit so thank you yeah thank you and I, I
part of me wants to go back to the high school where I teach and say, hey, chemistry teacher, you need to watch this section of the council meeting because chemistry matters. And here's an example. Do your kids take chemistry? OK. Um, what's that? Exactly. Yeah. No, this, here it is like in, in the world uh, mattering. So thank you all so much. We have to ask them if they thought they'd have to be in front of city council when they got their degrees. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I am going to make one further uh, adjustment in the agenda, which is to move item 12, the Homelessness Task Force um, item, to right now, um, just because I know there are some folks here interested in talking about it. Um, so, uh, right. Oh, so there um, we have a, a request, and actually, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Cameron. Invite the uh, members of the Homelessness Task Force to to come on up and. Uh, uh, tell us about uh, this item. So I am a staff representative for this committee. Um, I do want uh, the Homelessness Task Force Committee to really talk about this. Um, since it is a funding ask, I have no opinion. Thank you. <laughs> acting city manager. If you would mind introducing yourself. Sure. Uh, Ken Russell, uh, chair of the Homelessness Task Force. Zach Hughes, member of the Homeless Task Force. Jody Kelly, uh, member of the Homeless Task Force. It's a little bit of a mouthful. <laughs> um, thank you for hearing from us. Um, you should all have this memo um, that um, city staff, i.e. Cameron, worked very hard on and did some really good work. And, um, and I, I think we've sort of made the case previously to you the importance of sanitation downtown it kind of follows nicely after the last conversation and um, it's a need um, that I think would help address the concerns of the downtown merchants um, it's certainly the need for downtown bathrooms has been expressed by merchants um, Jody's a, a representative of the MBA on our task force um, there you know we you know had we came up with a couple of citing ideas, um, and um, based on the mayor's feedback today, um, we want to make sure that one of those bathrooms was near the downtown, you know, near the business downtown, which makes good sense. And it's a Porta John, and I I think um, it does seem like it would be really good for the vitality and quality of life downtown for better public bathrooms to be put together in time. Um, and um, somebody had mentioned, you know, the information booth that probably belongs to the state, um, but, you know, I can, you, it would be a beautiful building for it. Um, something to think about. Um, I know that people have asked about the transit center. I know the GMT owns that. I don't know what the, you know, what sort of negotiations could look like at some point, but we do appreciate uh, Cameron um, and Bill's responsiveness on this topic. Um, and um, and then the lockers, the lockers is, I think we've explained it before, but the basic idea is folks who are out there, get their gear stolen, gets wet, um, you know, their lives are in chaos. And so ha this is a good, uh, inexpensive, practical way to help give people a stronger platform and help them move along um, towards a healthier way of being. So. Um, do you want to add anything? Or? Yeah. Uh, so I represent the Montpelier Business Association, um, and recently I sent a survey out to the business community um, asking them what they thought the most pressing issues were um, with regards to the homeless um, situation. And many of the um, Consistently, it was the accessible bathrooms, 24-hour accessible bathrooms. Uh, many of the businesses, including myself, spend um, a lot of time cleaning up, um, cleaning up, you know, excrement from our sidewalks, from our yards. Um, it's not only a terrible eyesore, but it's also a uh, human health hazard. Um, we have laws against public urination and defecation, um, but there isn't a solution. Um, I think it would be fair to say that most people would choose to be inside a bathroom than to 
lose their dignity having to go to the bathroom out, out on the sidewalk. Um, it isn't any mystery that we all need to void. Um, if we don't, we die. Um, and so we really definitely need to give people um, the opportunity to do that in a dignified and a, a health conscious way. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought here. Um, the other, the other situation that helps to support the need for 24-hour bathrooms um, is from the business community in that there's lots of people that need a bathroom to use, not just the homeless. Um, we, our businesses sit right within the farmer's market, and which is a wonderful place to be surrounded by. It's such an amazing event uh, from spring until fall, and we really love to be there and be in the hustle and bustle. Um, but, you know, last year during that time on a Saturday, a four-hour period of time that the farmer's market was going, we would have, on the average, 20 people come through our um, front area into the bathroom and use it. Um, and it's not that we had said they could use it, but they, the vendors decided that that was what they were going to do. And I love farmers, but they wear big, muddy boots, and they track that through the hospital. And I'll tell you, my staff was just like, enough. We're not doing this any longer. So we did, towards the end of the season, just say, you guys, we can't. But the problem is, is they'd have to walk to City Hall to use the bathroom. And they can't leave their stands for that long. Um, so there's definitely, you know, the situation for them also is to have uh, a reliable source, which it makes sense for the one of the bathrooms to be down on the Taylor, um, Taylor Street area. Um, and then the one other concern would be monitoring it, keeping it clean. Um, if we have, you know, we have a lot of tourists in the area and it, they love coming to Montpelier, it's such a wonderful place, um, but we don't want eyesores. We want to make sure that it's being monitored and, you know, last thing anybody needs is to go into a bathroom that's really dirty. So um, that's the viewpoint of the businesses. Right. And, and just to be clear, that this is you know a stopgap measure, and it, there's a the, what Cameron found is a is a company that does service the units once a month, but we're looking at expedite you know more frequent. And Zach, you have some words? Yes, I uh, do have some uh, words. Um, you know, I do. I did end up sympathizing with the business community on a Sunday. Uh, I was transiting through the main street. And um, the strong smell of urine was very present, was very uh, strong. It was all. It wasn't just in one area. It was straight down to the corner. Um, and I even let uh, Ken know immediately um, that I was concerned and that we needed to prioritize this. Um, I think I've also heard from others. What are we doing about those bathrooms? Because you know that. The, and I've even, yeah, ever since joining this committee, I've had pictures of myself being out there. What would I do in those situations? And I think it's, um, you know, I have to agree, my colleagues here, that it is an important issue. Lockers are equally as important as the uh, people, a place to store their belongings. Um, basic stuff, we're not talking about the grandmother's photo album. We said that today. Um, but a basic, dignified way of doing it. And um, I continue to thank the city and the city council for uh, working on this process with us. Um, we are the leader here in this right now. And um, so I just uh, thank you for that. And I want to close real quick by just thanking Glenn for his service on the committee. Yes. Okay. I, I know. And he said he was welcome to come back if he wanted to. <laughs> Um, he made, done. said he was done. <laughs> okay, so we really appreciate that. We would invite anybody to come by the committee uh, during our time, um, you know, because I think learning about the processes and stuff is really important, you know, as, and especially when you have new counselors come on. That would be really cool. Uh, so uh, thank you for your time tonight. Let's go see. Connor. So I think like the first thing that comes to mind is we probably all agree once a month service in the portable bathrooms is pretty insufficient. So the question might actually be for Cameron, what what city staff would be responsible for this? None. Do they have the capacity? No. So the um, 
proposal would be to have a company provide the bathrooms of the porta johns, so it would be um, monitored and cleaned <laughs> by that company. It would not be coming from city staff. So that was something we could definitely look into if we contract out with for the service. How often they're coming and servicing the bathrooms? Okay. Right, I'll, I'll echo. Oh, go ahead, Jeff. Dan. Yeah. I'll echo Connor's. I'll echo Connor's comments because I, it could be worse than having none um, if they're insufficiently monitored. Having been on many a camp out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Donna. So that, that means the price we have is a once a month monitoring price? Um, that's what they quoted me. Um, so that's up for debate if that means we, um, if this money is approved, we go into contract, maybe it would start in April instead of March just to fit within that budget constraint. Um, I just want to note um, the location of the uh, Port John on, on Taylor, well, it says near Taylor Street or off the bike path. Just where the X is at that point is probably, I, I would advocate that it not be quite exactly there, um, just because that is, I mean, that's that's like the site of uh, the new Confluence Park, which I know was still in progress, but um, that's uh, that's kind of a, a vista right there, and so it would just be kind of a, uh, I think it'd be an odd place to have a, uh, uh, port potty there. I think once we get this, if this is approved, if y'all do approve this, um, we can work with staff. Yeah. Like the committee can work with staff to come up with a um, more appropriate place in that area. Yeah. And I, I agree. I think having it somewhere in that area, that makes sense. And to be fair, uh, we, you know, th that's a piece of property that we own. And so it makes sense for it to be somewhere on that piece of property. So we don't have to ask anyone else's permission. But, um, but there, it may, I mean, who knows? There might be another um, landowner that would be willing to host it, knowing that it's going to be serviced by somebody else um, that when, if it's in a logical place. Um, so I just want to keep that option open, um, depending on uh, who might be willing to, to, if there are other places that might be willing to, to host it. Um, other comments? Jack. I, I think this is, there's a real need for this. Um, I. We're we're in we're faced with the uh, situation of once again uh, having a, a request for city funds not you know outside of the budget uh, process and so uh, it's a it's a small uh, funding request but I'm has the uh, city staff identified uh, availability of funds and source of funds for this. I've been um, told by our finance director that we could make this small amount work within our current budget. Thanks. Um, another question that occurred to me looking at the, sh should we talk about the bathrooms first and then the, uh, lock okay, I'll, I'll hold the other question. Are there any comments about, oh yes, go ahead. Uh, sorry. The only other thing is, I, I mean, this is very clearly a temporary solution. And has the committee talked about more permanent solutions? I mean, just just roughly, you know, speculatively. I mean, I mentioned, you know, that information booth looks like a nice, you know. You could have, <laughs> I yeah. think that has been used yeah. as a. Yeah. Well, you know. yeah. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Um, um, but no, I mean that. I mean. I, no, not really in detail. And okay. and again, I think this is a good partnership with the business community, um, a good common cause. Right. That, you know. Well, I mean, it strikes me as something that goes beyond simply this immediate need to a larger, you know, you're talking about the farmer's market and we're talking about, you know, we're no, no longer talking about really the homeless population, but we're talking about the, the public population, the public, yeah. you know, that circulates downtown and, you know, its impact on businesses that the businesses don't necessarily provide these facilities, but, you know, uh, a family that comes to the farmer's market that, you know, the kids need to go, um, you know, what kind, a lot of towns that attract this type of population of visitors will have these facilities and we don't necessarily have them. I mean, they're, we've got some in City Hall, but you know, this may be the sort of next step and it seems like it would be, you know, while it, this may go beyond your charge, it does seem like it's, it would be nice to see 
a more permanent solution proposed and given your looking into this already okay so we'll be renamed the homelessness and bathroom yeah, task right right <laughs> but i mean it, it does seem uh, i hate to put my dirty work on <laughs> but at this at the same time i mean i i think that this is you know this meets your solution but i think it can have a broader okay yeah and i think that's and, and frankly it's it's i think for us it feels good to, to this is a solution that just is a no-brainer and and certainly in response to the merchant complaints or concerns issues so i i, I think we we, we uh, speaking not for the whole committee but it sounds like we should that makes good sense did you have something to add yeah yeah Hi, Mike Miller, planning director. Um, so I hate to be the one who's going to be showing up to go and let you know this is not the first time that this has come to my office, and this actually hasn't come to my office. Um, but it, you can't have Port Johns in the floodplain. It's just a flat-out no-no. It can't happen. <laughs> That makes sense. We did move one of, like, the, okay. the task force did um, have a first proposal that did have um, a Port of John in the floodplain, and, and we were... Because Confluence Park would be in the floodplain. Okay. So, obviously, I, this is why we have not, I mean, this is a proposal, okay. and we yep. will make sure we work with you and get that cleared. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's the, the floodplain goes, is a very large area. I mean, for, for State Street, it's going all the way out to the pit. So wow. from the river to behind all those buildings is the floodplain. Um, there's less floodplain as you go down Barry Street. So as you go down Stonecutter's Way, there's um, portions in Stonecutter's Way, but that's away from the farmer's market, and that's away from um, the, the downtown solution that we're looking for. There are, there are ways of getting around it, but it's something, again, it goes to a more long-term solution you have to build up and elevate where you put the portage on onto something. We've talked about, well, it would have to be on a, on a platform, elevated, and once you're doing it, now you're talking um, needing to have the ramps to, to be ADA accessible and all these other pieces. So it can be done in the floodplain, but it has to be elevated above the floodplain so in a flood, it doesn't discharge the waste. Right. And, that's, and other communities in the state can kind of get, get away with it for a little while. D DEC, they live and work here. They will go to our farmer's market and they will call us. By, by Monday morning, I will have a phone call telling me that Portageon can't stay there. And so um, it's just the reality of living in Montpelier. So, so Is I that just, true for both sides of State Street? Uh, both sides. A State Street from the river all the way to um, the back of the pit is all floodplain. Um, mm -hmm. It goes into State House Lawn. Um, it's, it's a very large area um, a lot of our downtown in the flood uh, and it's it's weird to to think of it because you think when you get up to where um the transit center is it's actually uphill from state street okay. so it, it's actually a kind of a weird thing that actually you're almost out of the floodplain at so i think bank. that's my question because on this little map in the memo um th there's the the two places marked are one right across the uh, right across Taylor Street from the transit center, I think, and then down in Confluence Park. Am I understanding that right? So I, at the transit. So I didn't think that that little um, balloon was. Yeah. Th I thought that balloon was just consequential of like we're just trying to find this location. Yes. That that was not like uh -huh. a, we're putting a, a portage on. At the place with the balloon. Does okay. that make so sense? So it does make sense. I think I was reading it differently, and I should have figured this out in the ta task force meetings all this time. <laughs> We've been looking at this. <laughs> but, um, but to me, location one near Taylor Street off the bike path was the balloon. The second one to me was um, location two, we don't know, somewhere near downtown. Um, and that was the, the first, the X in the Confluence Park, which is obviously not going to happen. But the Taylor Street possibility also is I, impossible i believe they would both be in the floodplain unless we put it on like a fire tower uh, yeah unless it's <laughs> elevated in some some place Duh. Well, so would it be appropriate to ask both planning and dpw to work as staff with the homeless task force 
to to offer other locations to the city council to consider or do you we could certainly pr provide maps or if there's locations that you're thinking of would this be in or would this be out we could certainly go with that and if we're looking at a larger you know elevating something so it's above the floodplain right. then we can get some I mean, you know the, the new transit center was built above the floodplain. So if you're looking at the floor of the transit center, you know, if you were going to elevate something in that area, you'd be elevating to, to about where that, where that floor is. Um, and certainly, if you were standing there looking towards State Street, it goes down to State Street. So if you're right on State Street, it's going to be something that'll be, you know, four or five feet up in the air. Langdon Street, Court Street. Those are... Those are fine, definitely, right? definitely three or four feet. It would be maybe even more than that okay. on it's Langdon Street because of the North Branch. That's a flood from yeah. the North Branch, so that's right on the river. And City too. Hall as well. Uh, yeah, we're we're yeah. in floodplain. Okay. Yep. Pretty much everything. <laughs> <laughs> but we're in a building, so, so we, we fall under different rules. So. I think my question for at this point would be: Does it make sense to uh, approve this money now? anticipating that you'll figure this out or should we wait until there's a location before approving the money and um i don't have strong feelings about that <laughs> i i, I, yeah, I would have I'd, I'd have stronger feelings to so let's let's find locations for these things to see given First. the risk the limitations because it may push it so far out that either one or two doesn't make sense anymore yeah, and we, and I mean, I, I mean, I don't know, but depending on your agenda, we could probably get the floodplain map tomorrow and yeah. go from there and do some thinking. It wouldn't take much. That's right. Uh, Lauren. And, and maybe in that, we could get the, um, to Connor's question about the maintenance, see mm -hmm. if that would change the um, estimates to get that answer as well. So mm -hmm. we could have a more solid understanding. Okay. And so let's anticipate having you all back um, at a future meeting. Um, is there any consideration for the lockers as a separate ask? Well, yes. So I okay. um, just wanted to make sure we dealt with that first. Sounds like we're um, generally in agreement about the... Um, just one other thing about the bathrooms. I'd like to see staff talk to GMT and, and why that facility isn't open more, mm -hmm. both for riders and other people. Okay. Because the city hall is 24-7. Even if it's not 24-7, it's a lot of hours that buses pass through there. And I think we should be encouraging them to staff it. So that would give us two ready-made inside bathrooms, and we can supplement it with porty pots. Yeah. Uh, just to be clear, I don't think City Hall is open 24/7. There is a bathroom police, police station 24/7. Sorry, did I say City yeah. Hall? Police station. Okay. okay. Cool. Uh, yes, Lauren. One more clarifying question that um, kind of goes to both the lockers and the bathrooms. Could you just remind me? So we had allocated 10 we had approved up to ten thousand dollars to open the shelter early that whole amount was not spent because of the time lag and getting it open um and, and then we got the good news that the shelter can open early is is that whole ten thousand has been allocated for the shelter for both ends of it or what's the, what's the status of that money that we had previously already approved so the shelter is still um open and plans to stay open to the end of april um, so I I won't know what that funding looks like, what that where that money's at. It might cover it at the, but I don't know until the end of April. But that's being held that for 10, that thousand. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, any comments on the lockers? Check. I think it's a great idea. As I was looking at this, um, again, as a legal aid lawyer whose uh, career involves a lot of the time challenging what government is doing I, th I think I'd like to see some there's some stuff that just wasn't clear to me that I think needs to be addressed like I don't didn't see here uh, how many lockers there are which is uh, uh, one point another point is assuming that there are that there's more demand than there are lockers how would the government decide who gets them? Um, and if the, uh, uh, if the government decided to uh, kick someone out of their locker or bar them from the locker, 
what would the process be for the what, what's the standard what, what would the process be for making that decision what would be the process for a person to appeal that decision because it's it would be an adverse government action that uh, the person would have a, a right to challenge possibly and possibly right <laughs> as lawyers or something uh, <laughs> yeah but uh, but I think these are questions that should be addressed. No, that's I, well ta points well taken. Um, yeah. No, oh, those are good points. And it could, it um, it could be something as simple as first come first served up until there's uh, all the resources uh, is fully uh, used up. You know, there are government programs that are like that where. Uh, there's a certain amount of money appropriated, and when that's all spent, the, per <coughs> the next person, even though their need is as great as the person ahead of them online, doesn't get it because there's no more money. So w in terms of the, that initial allocation, would a lottery suffice to be equitable and fair? I think it might, yeah. And then, and then the other thing is the appeal, if you get kicked out and make sure that that's there's due process or I, I would want to see some kind of due process protection yeah okay well or or at least i mean it may make sense enough sorry jump in is no, that okay. whether or not there is i mean due process is due when there's an interest involved whether it be a property interest or a liberty interest and they may not have a property interest in a in a gratuitous rental locker um and, and it may just not, I mean, there's no reason to necessarily add it if there doesn't have to be there, but if we don't have it and it has to be there, that's where we get into trouble. And um, underst understanding what interests are created, because I'm sure other cities have done this before, and you know, what, what process, I'm, I'm sure we can just crib from something that's been effective and that's been tested um, to a certain extent so that we don't end up in a situation where you know, the last thing we want to do is do something nice and then end up costing ourselves a lot of money to, um, when to, inf I, when one of the other lawyers in my office. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yes, so just stay out of it. <laughs> don't, yeah, yeah, yeah. The homelessness there, task force did, um, benchmark this. There's actually not a whole lot of governments who are doing this work and by not a whole lot, I mean, I didn't find any. So mm -hmm. I did find a couple nonprofits who do this work on behalf of, um, localities. Is that the one you're, you put in here? Yes, ma'am. Do you have any data on them or any of their policies? I did. I, I took the, um, the draft that you're looking at for the locker program. Um, the Homelessness Task Force did a lot of work on that, but that came straight from the organization that I found that's been doing this the longest. I mean, I, I would bet the VLCT would have some language um, to avoid this kind of thing. Um, you know, it's, it's, it just strikes me that if it was very clear from the beginning that you, you don't have a necessarily a right or an interest in this only to say that this is something you're, you, you know, will give you access to this locker. It's really a service and a, a, a gratuity, but there's no guarantees here. You know, um, that might might help in us. And, and, and uh, while this, there may not be the, this exact thing I, you know, this proposition's regularly tested in, in court as to, you know, whether there's, whether something constitutes a property interest in something um, that requires extensive due process. And if there is, we don't have to have, it's not like we have to have a major trial every time somebody wants to get kicked out of a lot, or we want to, you know, someone's removed from a locker, but I think it has to be sort of thought out. Um, and then create some system created so that it, there's a fairness there and an opportunity for them to grieve if they have a right to grieve. The so question that often comes up in due process questions is how much process is due? And right. it's yeah. more if you're evicting someone from their home and less if uh, probably for something like this. Mm -hmm. So uh, what if but I, I assume that this has not been the uh, locker policy has not been reviewed by our lawyer. No. Um, so uh, none of these things. These are all proposals. So, yeah. No. Fair yeah. enough. Yeah. Uh, so I wonder if a review from the lawyer would come would um, generate these kinds of 
comments or suggestions, and I'm not sure it, it would. Uh, do you think that would be beneficial? Yeah. No. I mean, I, I, I think they can do a little bit. I mean, they can do the research to mm -hmm. look to see if if this has been challenged and to, yeah. to say, I mean, you know, the, the benefit of having them as opposed to say Jack and I is that, you know, their <laughs> professional licensure is on the line. We're just, we're just hobbyists, right? <laughs> uh, well, and, and, well, and if it's something that ultimately helps prevent a yeah. lawsuit in the future, that would be useful. Exactly. So, okay. um, so yeah. we don't have to try to figure this stuff out. <laughs> I, I think if we asked them, if we went to them with with the, these particular questions in mind, um, these concerns, I imagine they would come up with some suggestions. Okay. Um, Go to the city attorney and say these lawyers on the, on the city council <laughs> raised yes. all these questions about due process. And stuff. <laughs> they would let us build in the floodplain. <laughs> and one says not necessarily, <laughs> and the other says absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, my, I, my, oh, sorry, Donna, go ahead. No, I have a, a different kind of question. It, it has to do with when you did the budget, Ken, you didn't use a number to get there, like how many lockers you were thinking of at what cost, or did you just sorry. pick a number? Um, I'm sorry I keep answering these questions. Well, you, you, you did the work on this. Uh, <laughs> I still have no opinion, um, <laughs> but uh, that was benchmarked against some companies who are selling used lockers, which is why we don't have a number. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's it's really based on what's available on the market at any given time. Um, I cost I priced out new lockers and they're exorbitantly priced. So used it is, um, and so it's really based on availability um, from some of the sources that we found. So I don't know a number. I was just. Uh, sort of estimating what I saw as averages of costs mm -hmm. on websites to buy used lockers. When did the senior center lockers, there were like eight of them, right? They, yeah, they're, they're not. Um, right, which we can't yeah. use, but that was mm -hmm. a ballpark we were in. I, I just don't know how you come with a number if you don't decide 10 used lockers, 20 well, used lockers. Well, they lockers. all depend on how they, so anyway, when I was looking for used lockers, there's, there's many variables, how used they are, how big they are, so I, I, I just tried to use the average price of lockers that I thought would be appropriate. I know. How many? Six to eight to 10. I couldn't, yeah. I don't know. That's a fair answer. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I was thinking you might have a number that you thought we needed. So I, like is t t t I'd rather not do 10 when we need 25. Yeah, no, I'd rather really know what the need good. is and then that's go from there. Not, that's, that's all. Yeah, I wasn't trying point. to put you on the spot, Cam. No, it's fine. I was just trying to. I'm here to answer there questions. Must have been some number there of we need this many lockers. So. Um, I think uh, I know Don had an opinion on this, and I. When we come back, sounds like we'll come back on the bathrooms anyway. Uh, Glenn. Um, I agree. It would be great to know just how many lockers we would need for the the um, for the the demand. Uh, at the same time, uh, I think we know we need more than zero, and we have the potential for a relatively small space for them. Mm -hmm. um, basically, like right out the door that way, uh, which I don't think would easily fit more than maybe a dozen or so, the way I'm envisioning it at least. So my sense was, again, for, for this initial, like, we just want some, um, six to eight felt like, six to eight to ten felt like kind of what we can, what we can tackle with the, um, at least that's what's been in my head the whole time in the conversation. It has been very vague, but. And you're looking at a place. And, and you already have in mind location? Uh, I thought. It w I, I missed that. Yeah, it was just behind City Hall. Um, behind City Hall. Yeah, yes. I, well, yeah, between between City Hall and the police station, basically, within range of the. Uh, I knew it was in this range. I just didn't yeah. know of an actual. Like the back side of the, the back tree wall. By the oh, I see. Yeah, I guess I d I'm not that specific. But I'm thinking, yeah. like, tucked in right alongside City Hall, yes? Because there's a concrete block over here, so I wasn't thinking if you were going to put it on top of that. Mm -hmm. okay. um, the general idea would be to put it uh, 
Now, like I said, this is all proposal. None of this has been approved or permitted. We'd have to go through that process, um, is put it right behind the building against the wall underneath where the fire escape is, because it blocks nothing or no egresses, and there's nothing there currently. Okay. Um, fair enough. Uh, so it sounds like y you all are going to come back anyway. Um, and I, I think it would probably, I, I would, uh, I think even with the lockers, it would probably make some sense to come back with some uh, information about that. Does that seem fair? Yeah, thank okay. you. Yeah. Okay. Appreciate it. And yeah. this is all part of the process, and, and yeah. um, I think it's all of this is, um, you know, great thinking and a good idea. So. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. I appreciate thank it. Thank you. Yeah. I'm hoping you feel our support. No. Oh, no. Sorry for all the questions. I mean, yeah. I mean, just before, I mean, you mentioned GMT and those, I mean, a lot of people said it's, it's a no-brainer. Why isn't that facility hosting lockers and bathrooms? I mean, at one time we talked about um, lockers for bicyclists so they could bring their bike in, stow stuff, you know, even showers. I mean, there was a lot of in the vision that didn't happen. So I think we should still revisit that. Yeah, I mean, if you can't turn the bus around, maybe you could have a locker. <laughs> um, I want to make sure I don't forget to say this. Um, I'm just thinking about that tree that's behind City Hall. just want to make sure we protect it somehow. In Noted. Thank you. Yep, that's all. Um, okay. All right, so we're jumping back to item seven. Um, thank you all, by the way. Thank you. Thank you for your time and your, your efforts on this. All right, so uh, to the uh, Center Vermont uh, Solid Waste Management uh, appointment, uh, uh, Donna, come on up. Hello. So you do actually have an applicant? <laughs> it's Donna. <laughs> so we did advertise. Um, we had a couple of applicants. They had conflicts of interest because of what they do for a living. Um, a more oh, sure. So we had a uh, conflict of interest in the couple of applicants. Um, Bill and I had a conversation, given that July 1 of this calendar year, there's a major change in the solid waste regulations. Food scraps have to be diverted. We're actively working with a committee here, and that some of that decision making on a regional basis will happen in the next few months with the Central Vermont Solid Waste District. Um, I did offer, as a staff person, to um, be willing to fill that position um, until um, a resident could be found. I have a long history of solid waste management, several different states um, here in Montpelier with the Central Vermont Solid Waste District for 15 years as their executive director. Um, so um, I'd be happy to p be in that position and to um, help us achieve what we want to achieve um, in the interim. And as soon as um, a viable candidate comes forward, I'd be happy to step back and do what I do on a regular daily basis for the city. Uh, but we would, uh, it, but if it's going to be you, then we need to make a formal appointment. Yes. Yeah. Um, so thoughts, discussion, we can also go into executive session if you'd like. Ooh. Uh, Dan. I just sort of, you know, given your other obligations to the city, is this, I mean, I don't want to have this be something that might break your schedule. Being a person who overcommits himself as well, <laughs> I understand. <laughs> um, but, I mean, is this something that you, you'll be able to manage? I think I'd be able to manage it. Um, my understanding is that the um, CVSWMD um, board meets once a month. Um, the preparations, I'm usually looking at their mm -hmm. agendas anyhow. Um, the other work that I'm doing is on my roster anyhow with the committee. So I think it's a very minor addition to my um, regular um, workload. Um, and um, I'm just, I know a lot of the folks at the Central Vermont Solid Waste District, and it's just been a 
a longstanding passion of mine for years. So I, I, I don't mind fulfilling that role. And I, I don't think it will um, extend me um, in a way that interferes with the other work. Thank you, though, for sure. asking. Um, Lauren. Um, thank you for your being willing to do that. I mean, obviously, you couldn't really ask for more expertise <laughs> and be able to jump in. And as the appointee, but it turned out, and this was a lesson learned for a first year counselor, the meeting time just doesn't work for me. So I've never been able to go. And I was the alternate, so I didn't feel that guilty. I read the materials. But having somebody who could actually, like, we're not being well represented right now, and I, I'm sorry to say. So um, I, but having somebody, even if it's interim, until um, somebody else, or you could assess if it fits within your other um, many obligations. Um, but I would love to be able to have us well represented there, because um, I feel very guilty that it turned out I can't make the meeting times. Fair enough. Uh, Donna. I would love your application of your ex expertise, and it really fits in well with this transition into the whole food composting. So I would like to make a motion that we accept Donna Casey to be a representative of the Solid Waste District. Second. For the discussion, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, so you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. All right, and on to the rental inspection program. Hi. So Mike Miller, again, planning director. Um, so I'm here uh, to talk about uh, something that Kevin Casey, our community development specialist, had been working on, which was the rental inspection. Uh, so this was a, a, one of the tasks, um, one of the actions that was on last year's list of things that we were supposed to look at. And it was an inventory or survey of rental properties in the city uh, to determine if rental units in the city meet minimum housing standards. And so um, this has been kind of a, a little bit of a challenge. Um, I've, as somebody who worked in Berry City uh, and managed the, the rental inspection program over there, um, the rental inspection programs are really looking at uh, whether something does or doesn't meet minimum housing standards, not whether it meets a certain level of quality, um, you know, are, are people getting a good value for their dollar? Um, it's really about is it meeting minimum housing standards? Do they have um, refrigerators and stoves in the kitchen? Do they have um, GFI outlets in their bathrooms? Do they have smoke detectors? Do they have locks on their doors? Um, so, um, what Kevin put together and what you have in a memo here. Uh, looks at, um, puts together a proposal, um, because before this is going to be a, a labor intensive process, we wanted to make sure that we kind of put the process out, this is what we're going to do. We would inventory 30 units, um, and we would do it in a random sample, and uh, we would then be able to go through and analyze those. And so we wanted to make sure before we did it that everybody's on board with this is, this is the the inspection sheet we would use, these are the number of things we would be doing. Um, so if the council does choose to move forward with this, um, we've got an approved process to move forward. Um, so Kevin did prepare this. Um, it, it is rather labor intensive. It will take away from other activities and duties that he's doing. But it is something, if this was still the council's desire to move forward, here's a proposal that we could do um, to fulfill what was on last year's strategic plan for this item. And I guess I'll leave it open to questions. Let me, I'll, I'll just kick it off. Um, I, I'm really interested in this program. I think it has a lot of value. I think a good blueprint for it is laid out in this memo. But we can't be adding like 120 hours to some of our staff here, especially Kevin. Kevin's like a, he's like a bumblebee there. He's, he's everywhere <laughs> with his hands and so much. So I think anything worth doing is worth doing right. And I, I think I would take issue to sort of, you know, just doing it halfway here. And I, I, I think if we're going to do it, let's do it through the budget process. Let's have somebody come in and do it. Let's add a part-time staffer if we need to, because uh, we're going to have higher staff turnover if we keep burning, burning them out with all these new projects. So that's just where I'm coming from right off the bat here. So uh, interesting you brought that up. I was wondering if this would be a good uh, project for like a some kind of an intern or a um, 
Vista AmeriCorps kind of person? I don't have any Vistas on my... Right, but I mean, in thinking yeah. about next year, yeah, you know, if, if we were to budget for uh, an AmeriCorps person that could look into this, um, uh, what do you think about that possibility? I mean, I know it puts it off a little ways, but... It, it, yeah, it, I mean, it puts it off. Uh, there, There is always an oversight. Um, it doesn't always take away... It doesn't always save time mm -hmm. to take somebody and teach them how to do something that they don't know how to do, so you spend yeah. a lot of time teaching them, which has value to that person. Um, but I don't know if it necessarily takes away that, that much time. Um, but it's, it's certainly something I talked to Kevin about. He's managed the VISTAs in the past um, mm -hmm. to see what that would be. But VISTAs in the past were about $16,000. So if you're looking for a number of what the VISTAs are, um, that's been what we budgeted in the past for them. But that would probably be less than, say, like a part-time person. Oh, it certainly would be less than a part-time person. Right. Uh, Lauren. Um, so totally understand the the need to like 30 units or whatever we pick that seems reasonable to pull off. Um, I mean, it seems like the certainly concerning that the per, if permission is denied, like I get that, but the people who might be most motivated to deny permission might be some of the worst housing. So you're getting a skewed sample, and how do you account for that? Which maybe there are ways to, but just would be curious your thoughts on that. And it was also making me think of, you know, is there some way to make this more enticing? And I was thinking about like our energy efficiency goals. Could it be like, can we come do an inspection and we'll do an energy audit while we're there and leave you with some materials? Or is there some way to make this something that's <clears throat> meeting multiple city goals and that people would actually want to participate instead of something that feels punitive and like you might get in trouble or something if you participate so people would have an incentive to say no and if there's no downside then yeah it's, I mean happen. at this point it's strictly a voluntary survey I mean the question that was out was is there a problem that needs to be solved so this wasn't meant to be going out and trying to solve any problems this is this is simply how do we go out and try to determine if a problem exists um, and how big of a sample size is that it, it you know it takes it takes time to, to organize these it, it is a um, as somebody who managed this in Barry City on a on a larger scale, the contacting landlords, contacting every tenant, giving them 48 hours notice, scheduling those blocks of time, making sure people are there on time to be able to let you in for a period of time. Um, these um, it's not just the time of the inspections. There's a considerable amount of time in preparation. How do you take the paper surveys, convert them into digital surveys, so we can then do some data analysis afterwards? Those types of things that we would we would have to solve. And I, I think how big a sample size is, you know, and and how do we entice to get more people to participate? Um, it, it still comes down to the, I think the underlying question, which we don't know, which is. Um, the minimum housing survey is really about determining whether we have a lot of units that don't meet minimum housing codes. And our, our plan with the 30 was we figured if we surveyed 30 and we got a, a reasonable sample of 30 and all 30 came back and passed, it's kind of coming back to the rental housing survey is probably what, which is what we think. The opinion of the building inspector, the opinion of Bob Gowans, myself, Kevin, is that um, we don't have a housing, a minimum minimum housing problem, minimum housing code problem. Um, this is these these are usually looking at much, much more significant issues. What we have is units that are going for eleven $1 hundred dollars a month, that you know are in poor quality, and probably are worth seven hundred fifty dollars a month, and people rightfully upset. But that's a market thing, and it's not you know as long as. Your roof's not leaking, and um, you know you've got GFI outlets in your bathrooms. Then you're going to meet you're going to meet the minimum housing codes. Um, I, I I hear you there. I also have to balance that with stories that my friends have told me about, like when their landlord didn't fix their broken window for a month. You know what I mean? Which would call would it would show up on on something like this. So. Um, and, and other housing authority type people telling me, you'd be surprised at the things that you find in Montpelier. And so 
I, I mean, I, I'm just, I'm telling you yeah. this because it's, um, it's hard to sometimes know how to navigate all, all like all of the, the stories, um, and the, 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 um, experiences. Yeah. Um, and, and the other, the other piece to keep in mind is we can only look at the, the units that are known. Um, so people who have perhaps an illegal unit, um, we're not going to be surveying those because, you know, if somebody has a, a unit in the basement that doesn't have proper fire egress, that's probably not on any of our lists that even exists. Um, the end point, and we have a couple of new faces, just to, to make sure people remember, um, when I did these in Barry City, one thing to keep in mind is the, the rental inspection program, if we went as far as to do the rental inspection program, the council has to be comfortable with the city evicting people and making them homeless. You know, I do that five times in Barry City. You have to be able to do that because if, if this unit doesn't meet standards and if your landlord will not fix that unit, I will be condemning that building and we will be finding you. We will obviously try to connect that person with as many services as possible, but that is the reality, a possible reality of an endpoint to a, to a minimum housing standard, which is that you actually end up being the person who pulls that trigger and says, I'm sorry, this doesn't meet code. The landlord won't fix it. We are hereby condemning this building and everybody has to move out. And I had to do that. Um, and it's, it's not fun. I did it in February. I did it to people who were not English speakers. Mm -hmm. It is not a, a, a very enjoyable process. Um, but it is a reality um, going down that route that yes, there's a lot of benefit to doing rental inspections if you have um, a lot of poor quality and, and you can work and st strong arm some landlords to fix up some qualities. But for a stubborn landlord, you can also get to a point of doing things that are in your core just don't sit well, but it's, it is the an inevitable end point that you have to be prepared that this could end up on your plate. Mike, um, how have we had any sort of um, comparison with the building inspector, with Chris, vis-a-vis -vis any of the, uh, you know, he regularly performs inspections of buildings, and it seems like some of his purview is going to overlap with some of these inspection qualities. I mean, is he noticing a deterioration in quality or coming back with reports? Has he weighed in on some of this? So there is, um, there is some overlap between them. Um, so what Chris is responsible for is for building codes and for health codes, mm -hmm. uh, which is slightly different than the minimum housing codes. Um, so there, the health codes can be violated by tenant issues as well as landlord issues. Um, a, a, a landlord may call Chris to investigate for health reasons because uh, somebody's a hoarder or somebody's just not taking care of their trash and you could end up with a tenant. So that, that can work either way. Um, we do have those issues. Um, we have uh, a number of Washington County mental health um, units um, that periodically uh, come back through um, because the, the tenants uh, sometimes have life challenges. And so um, but we always work with them and work with Washington County. Um, so we do have right. some of those that come through. And, and the building inspection, you know, as, as violations come up, as Chris finds building code violations, then those are addressed. But I mean, is he noticing, I mean, has he weighed in on this? Has he noticed any deterioration or, you know, surprisingly high number of building code issues or health code issues on his inspections? Not, not as much. Um, a number of units over his tenure here have been fixed up. Um, I, you know, there are a number of good landlords who have purchased properties and fixed up a number of, of older units and fixed them up. Um, that's not to say that there are a number of units that are deteriorating, mm -hmm. but I think I, I don't know what the ratio would be between you know the but bad I, ones that have been bought and fixed up. Right. And I mean, the reason I'm asking is, you know, we, we we do have the rental housing code in the state that he enforces through the Department of Health. Um, as well as our own building code. And, you know, wouldn't a better effort to sort of get out the word to tenants that this resource is there if they have an issue with some habitability or some quality, uh, you know, smoke detectors aren't installed or, you know, the, the, the 
water doesn't always run, um, you know, or any, or even, you know, I mean, the, I know the housing code even talks about like 65 degrees that it has to maintain a minimum, like three feet from the wall and off the floor kind of thing. Um, I mean, isn't, isn't that a more effective way rather than this sort of survey um, to sort of actually get out and fix some of these issues? Um, I'm sorry, I'm, yeah. that's a loaded question. <laughs> yeah, there is, so there's a, there's, there is a lot there. And, um, uh, Chris does a lot of these. We, we will get these calls anyways. Um, so uh, we will get calls from people. Some things we do address, some things we don't. Um, you know, and, you right. know, there's certain ones, you know, the, the, there's, there's, you know, some mold in the black in, in the bathroom or something like that. It's, it's you know, it, that, that may or may not fall into the, the health code. Um, and he does, if somebody calls and says they don't have heat, he's going to go out and take a look at it. Um, it it's just, you know, right. if, if we get a call, whether it's Bob Gowans, um, and, you know, sometimes it's related to other issues, but it's just something that we're going to check up on it and, and we'll make a determination if it's something that we deal with. Um, right. But usually if, if people have a question, they can always contact the building inspector and we can find out about going in. I think your point is well taken, though, to really work on our communication with the public about what their rights are as tenants. Yeah, I think the the, the, the issue that has come up with, with Chris, and because you're, you're sitting new to the, the council, is Chris has been, um, uh, is, is a fabulous resource and has been tasked with many things right. and has been doing a lot of work over the past couple of years. Um, so he's, his workload is overwhelming, so. Sure. Well, I mean, that, but that would be a logical place if he needs, if we need to expand that to, ex to expand his function. You know, because I understand he takes care of new construction, he takes care of existing construction. Um, I've tried to get a hold of Chris, and I know how <laughs> difficult a man he can be to reach. Um, but I, you know, it just it strikes me that this this may be an issue that we already have a an effective solution to, and if we can increase, you know, awareness in the community for those kind of things, I don't know where doing a survey is necessarily going to be a, an efficient or effective use of resources and it, and it comes down to the, the question of whether you want a reactive or a proactive process um, the the rental inspection the idea of a rental inspection pro program is that you're, you're going to be proactive uh, no tenant has to worry about any retaliations because there's going to be a random inspection those inspections are going to come through every five years so it becomes a proactive inspection and doesn't put it on that we can use the the departmental resource now whether we have enough resources in that department we can talk about separately um, but certainly a building inspection would be a place where we could do some reactive where if on a complaint basis we can which we do anyways on a complaint basis go and investigate for any building code or other violations Jack um, I started working in uh, tenants rights work in the early 1970s and I was one of the people who worked on the committee to develop the proposal in 2004. And I really have always thought that the only way to effectively enforce the uh, housing code is to have a periodic, a universal and periodic inspection system because it, uh, you know, with a backup for uh, for complaint driven inspections because if the uh, uh, as Mike said there's a serious concern about uh, retaliation and landlords do retaliate against tenants for uh, complaining about the condition of their uh, of their homes um, in the in 2004 I don't remember I don't have that report anymore the city may uh, have a copy of the Ray O'Connor's report, but I think the proposal, which got pretty far, it got as far as presenting it to the city council, I think it uh, was going to require at least two full-time inspectors to... Uh, There's going to be two and a half staff. ...to make the system, uh, system work. Um, and it just got to the point of the council not being willing to devote that amount of, uh, of money to, uh, to make that kind of inspection uh, program run. Um, 
the proposal we have now, you know, is to uh, do a spot check of the quality of housing, of rental housing in the city to see if um, the quality, if there's enough uh, inadequate or substandard housing to justify the investment in, uh, in a full inspection program. And obviously it's not exactly the same as what would be looked at because this this is a, a survey of housing meeting HUD uh, HQS housing quality standards, which isn't exactly the same as the requirements of the rental housing health code, although not that different really. Um, so the proposal here is uh, instead of going by the anecdotal evidence that we have some, from some people that say, sure, the housing quality, housing might not be great quality, but it's not substandard by uh, objective standards to do a systematic look of a sample of the housing, rental housing in Montpelier and uh, evaluate whether it appears that uh, there's a significant amount of uh, substandard housing in the, uh, in the city. And if we, uh, if we do this uh, survey and come to a conclusion that uh, conditions are not so bad that we need to have an inspection program, then we can put this question behind us, but uh, it also tells us that we need to be, uh, <coughs> do more tenant outreach and do other things to make sure that tenants know what they can do to get uh, secure their rights. But uh, as a, as a ma means of getting some baseline data on the qual housing quality of rental housing in Montpelier, I think doing a study like this makes some sense. Other and thoughts? Lauren. I guess just circling back to the question, like what kind of participation would you anticipate? Do you think it, there won't be a lot of refusal, so that issue isn't a big deal, or do you think that might become an issue? And do you feel like, you know, I know n equals thirty is meaningful in statistics, but like <laughs> yeah, does, we, does we, thirty we, feel like it, it would answer the question um, in a way that we would? put it behind us potentially if it came back or is it kind of like, we, yeah, it's just a we didn't snapshot. know uh, we I mean it's, it, the, you, it's really hard to know what your sample size should be because you have to know what the what your coefficient of dispersion is I mean you got to know you know where where is it and how is it clustered if it's all kind of spread out then you'll have a pretty you know and how, what your rate is but um, <laughs> we'll just have to take uh, you know we, we tried to pick a number that would give enough of a sample but within a reasonable budget. I mean, you know, if we went and decided we would do 100, um, we're talking a couple thousand units, rental housing units in the city. So, um, you know, if I think if statistically we'd, we'd probably need to have a lot more to have a statistically significant, but if we did 30 and found 12 that had major problems, then we probably are having more of a problem than we thought. If we do 30 and we end up with Six, but they're all relatively minor, easily fixable. You know, they're all good, but this one here should have an electrical outlet, and it doesn't. Um, you know, that's not as. Um, but we can put those together. But Kevin did reach out to um, because he does have uh, connections to a number of the landlords, and he did reach out to them and, and said, "Hey, you know, we're we're thinking of doing this. Um, would you be open to it if we contacted you about it?" And and they were all willing to. The major we've got probably five major landlords that probably are a majority of the units in the city. And for the most part, they were willing to, to cooperate with a, with a survey. You know, again, they're not going to be, even if we find a violation, we can't enforce the violation. We, we're just going in and doing a sample and, and, and doing it. Um, the tenants themselves would also have the right to refuse. So it's not just the landlords. The tenants may go and feel they, they don't want to cooperate as well. So. Love to see. Uh, Glenn and then Jack. Um, I think I'm a little concerned about the efficacy of this only because the anecdotal uh, 
stuff that I've heard is more about uh, illegal units, as you were talking about earlier, that wouldn't even be picked up by this kind of survey. Um, and yeah, I guess I'm, I'm just saying that I'm a little bit torn on whether I think this would be worthwhile or not. Uh, it seems like a good idea in general, and you know, I, I hear your and the staff's recommendations that it's hard and potentially not useful at this point in this way. Yeah, if if the issue is illegal units, we'd have to think about a different program. How would how do we root out these illegal units to do get them on up on? And do you have any guidelines about what that kind of program would be? I know that's a that's, more open question. That's, I mean, the, the best avenue for that would be to tie it into the reappraisal, because in a reappraisal, we go in and see every the insides of every building. It's very difficult for us to get access to the insides of a building um, unless, we're, unless we're invited in. Um, you, you, you know, for, from a zoning standpoint, a zoning administrator can only go in you know, with either permission or a search warrant. Um, so that's, we, we have really very little rights to go in, in, into a building. Building inspectors have a few more rights that, that we don't, but again, their rights are narrow. But when a reassessment comes through and Steve goes through, or whoever's working for him, they go through and map the whole thing out and they go and count the number of bedrooms and number of units to, to do the appraisal. And then, then the only things you're missing are the ones where he had a refusal. Um, which we, we have cases of those in the city as well. But uh, Jack and Donna, um, a couple of point point. Or I guess my main point is that granted, um, most of the land, big landlords apparently have told Kevin, yeah, we would be happy to do that. In my experience over many years, it's. The smaller landlords are more likely to be terrible landlords than big landlords, at least in terms of uh, failing to maintain their property. Um, that's just the way it is. And when I go over to the state house, or when I used to go over to the state house and lobby, you would hear hear them talk about how they want to treat the mom and pop landlords uh, well and. The mom and pop landlords, to a large extent, are the problem because they uh, they're undercapitalized. They think that uh, once they uh, they get the rent check and pay the mortgage and property taxes, the rest of the money is theirs. And <laughs> but so I don't know. The uh, I'm a little unclear on what the proposal is since the staff memo says. The staff recommends not moving forward with inspections at this time. Are you say are you recommending move, moving forward with this study, or are you recommending doing nothing? My recommendation would be um, to uh, based on the amount of work that it's going to take, and um, obviously take away from other things that staff could be working on. That I'm not sure that it's worth moving forward, but it has been identified. And so um, if you want to move forward, this is our proposal. So I guess that's a qualified answer of, of you know, if you were asking me would we do it, I would say no. My recommendation would be I, I don't think it's warranted based on the information I have. But the counselors and the mayor have heard different anecdotal information from other people. Um, so if you do want to move forward, as we said, we put this proposal forward, if people said, Rather than use this inspection form, use um, a different inspection form. Great. Um, we want to hear all of this up front before we go out and do the work because we want to, you know, if if this the, the HUD Section 8 inspection isn't the right metric, then let's put whatever the right metric is because if we go out, we want to make sure we're bringing you all back. You know, if we do all this work, we want you guys to be happy with what you're getting as a result. But it kind of sounds like your bottom line is to say, well, you know, you guys, when you put this on your priority list, it really was not a sensible thing to put on your priority list. And you, in your role as the head of your department, would say maybe the energy of the city would be directed, better directed somewhere else. It, yeah. 
<laughs> I think I kind of said that in last year when we talked about it. Oh, you're real so, clear. So um, we're just, as I said, we when when we're pretty, um, you know, staff have a lot, has a lot on their plate, and so we're just trying to to manage manage expectations. But you know, again, if this if this is a if this is continues to be a priority, and it is a priority, then we can fit this into our schedule. Um, and we'll, we will fit this into the schedule because you guys are asking us to do it. So that's the answer. I, based on that, my suggestion would be that we uh, take no action until after our uh, priority setting process and see what people think. I'm comfortable with that. Um, Donna, then Lauren. I'm, I'm sorry, I have a couple questions before you do that, Jack. One is the survey. It, it, we didn't really talk about the survey. You talked about the study. I'm really interested in sort of an anonymous survey and how we can encourage people who are shy about interfacing with any other source of information that could possibly do this on the website, electronically, whatever. And secondly, we do have an upcoming reappraisal that's going to happen, and that would seem to be the greatest time to dovetail and to really make an effort to seek out people's opinion as well as our reappraisal information. And so I would like to Well, focus. That, that would get to Glenn's, Glenn's question, but yep. that wouldn't answer. Um, the, the assessment won't um, tackle the minimum housing question. They're kind of two separate questions. Well, they are, but they'll give you, a, I think, a general uh, an assessment of where there are potentially problems, so it could at least narrow down where, you need to, where we need to look. <laughs> I just think there's values in both of those that would not necessarily mean a full staff because I think we need to staff it right. I totally agree. And this is like the second or third time I've heard you talk about this, uh, is that we do need the staffing. We need that commitment of staffing to do it right or don't do it. And I was hoping that maybe with the survey and using just the input from the upcoming appraisal to help us know where we should look for the problems it might help us narrow it down to a focus project. Lord. Yeah, I was, I was kind of thinking along a similar lines. I mean, is there an opportunity? I mean, it seems to me like moving forward with this is a lot of work for limited value and, and even answering the questions we're trying to answer. So it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to me. Um, I, I was kind of to Cameron's point and what Dan was bringing up of, um, you know, if, if there's education and kind of an outreach campaign paired with a survey to gather information to get a sense of, you know, does the community feel like this is a big problem? Are there a lot of people wrestling with this? And it's not just a few anecdotes. Um, that's one thing. And then, you know, maybe there's a better way of collating the data from, you know, what's happening on a reactive um, with a staff that's, that hopefully wouldn't be a lot more work, but give us a better idea of what are you seeing, have some data behind that. Um, to not create new work, but just better kind of summarize, you know, what are you seeing in the places where you are going into buildings and, um, you know, where Chris is inspecting already. If I could Go ahead. add, you know, it, th this also might be a ni nice opportunity to, to start to think about the large number of Airbnbs or short-term rentals that we have in the city um, that may not be falling under the view, but <clears throat> have the same impacts as um, as these long-term rentals, um, and whether you know whether when we start to think about the quality of our housing, if that if we want to rope that in as well. Because we do, yeah, we don't have any other than just going and looking on Airbnb. We don't have any program right. in place right now. No, but I mean, you know, if we're thinking about you know basic housing standards or rental standards. I mean, right now, I don't think that would, we're envisioning, and even your survey and study is envisioning the, um, the sort of long-term rental, the classic apartment, either multifamily, duplex, or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, accessory apartment. But, you know, to Glenn's point, <clears throat> I bet that we have a lot of sort of overlap between the Airbnb that slowly becomes the illegal apartment um, because it stops being a sort of short-term rental and becomes a long-term one even though it may not have all of the features of a traditional apartment and the, I think it anyway it, it just goes it's tagging on to Lauren's point it's 
something that for us to think about maybe down the line. So it sounds like we're in agreement that we're not doing anything right now exactly. Um, with possibly you know, <laughs> looking at a, a survey or like seeing how things arise with the future priorities and or you know the uh, common level assessments uh, appraisals that are coming up. Is that a fair a summary? Uh, okay. Uh, all right. So um, is that clear enough for now? Mike? Um, yeah, I mean, I can go and see what uh, information Chris has, a, a summary, if he has any summaries of his data. Um, okay. Uh, Jack? One, one other thing is that uh, the Montpelier Housing Authority does have to do an inspection of every one of its, uh, one of the apartments that are uh, having a Section 8 rental for every year. and. I think if you talk to Joanne, especially for uh, the uh, apartments that are new to the uh, to the program, you get a sense from her of how many of those are uh, are not meet, meeting HQS. You know the the ones that have been on the program year after year, you would think sure because they had to pass in order to uh, get approved, mm -hmm. and every year they have to pass, but. Someone, a, some, a, an apartment that hasn't been in the program, they have to get approved. Get a sense of how many of those she finds deficiencies. Yeah, and a good, a good follow-up to that um, is, you know, if you are talking with somebody, and they are a Section Eight, then they already meet. This, mm -hmm. this wouldn't help them. Because ba basically, by being a Section Eight, you're automatically in a unit that that already meets these minimum cool. housing standards. So, okay, it's only about 110 in the city. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Um, thanks for putting this together. Um, you know, <laughs> even though you're like, maybe we shouldn't do it. I uh, appreciate it. Well, we j just, like I said, we like to just make sure it's 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 clear that this is this is what we would do. But yeah. no, that's fair. Um, okay, so moving on, I we've kicked this down the line <laughs> many times now, so I would like to not kick it um, this time. I, I, I can be quick. I have okay, a little proposal yeah. on this, I think, okay. right? uh, because we are moving through the session pretty quick. Um, so uh, originally, I think this conversation started with me pitching that the city hire a lobbyist in the in the budget discussions. I will definitely continue doing that next fiscal year, <laughs> assuming I'm not beaten by a write-in candidate um, on Tuesday. Um, but, you know, there's an expression, you're either at the table or on the menu. I think we're on the menu a lot. Um, and being a capital city, what happens up the state house disproportionately affects us. So when I, when I look at some of the discussions we're having here, whether it be about like the quality of our rivers, whether it's about the homeless population, I think we're solving a lot of the issues that should be solved up there, or at least we should be at the table for them. Uh, so for me, like a lobbyist position, I, I didn't see it as somebody giving like a Cicero-like ask testimony in front of legislative committees. I saw it more as an information tracker. And I, I think maybe as a bit of a pilot, you know, I, I, I think the legislative agenda looks pretty good, but you know, it's, it's kind of narrow. Because a lot of what you do up there is play defense rather than offense, and you want to know what's coming at you. You got a $5 billion budget. You want to know if there's an opportunity that pops up that you can hop into it. So as a start, my suggestion would be um, town meeting week is next week. They've all gone home. I would ask if somebody else on council wants to volunteer with me, and hey, it could be Glenn, you're stepping down, <laughs> uh, to come up for a plan for the rest of the session where we get information out to people who need to know in city government and talking about, okay, um, you know, the state of Vermont hires a diversity director. There's going to be a big hearing in room 10 up there. Wouldn't it be nice if the social and economic justice had a heads up in case they want to send a member up there, you know? Again, hearing on the PFAS or something, we know about it. We should have somebody in the room. TIFF comes up, bam. So just coming up with a process where volunteer driven, because I don't want to put more on staff, we identify all the relevant committees and all the hearings coming up for the week, and we have a distribution list to get that out. And I think I would be satisfied if even we had a little bit more engagement just based on doing that for the rest of the legislative session. 
So that's a proposal I'm thrown out there, and I love a volunteer, if that's sort of the will of the council here. Uh, Lauren? I'm, I'm happy to volunteer. I. As, as, as someone who also, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm making a weekly legislative schedule anyway for the issues I track, so adding on um, additional priorities, um, some of which are the same, um, but looking for, for other things. I'm happy to, to help or play that role, and you can, but we can, happy to work offline on how that might look and what we can do to position the city as well as possible in these conversations. Sounds good to me. Mm -hmm. And again, I've just thrown out my ideas. So if it's a lousy one, let me know. Well, I, uh, yeah, go ahead, Dan. I, th I think it, actually, I think this is a very strong and overdue idea um, to have someone up there or having us engage in these conversations because I think it's absolutely correct. You, you know, you either participate, find these opportunities because no one, no one says, hey, let's stop this legislative committee process, call up the Montpelier people, see if they want to come and get some of this money. It, it's already done by the time they're talking about it. And so I think that makes a lot of sense. So I support it. I mean, I, if Lauren hadn't jumped in, I would have. Um, so oh, you could no, no, no. You're, but Lauren already jumped in. So <laughs> <laughs> but I'm willing to help too. I'll, I'll just I'll throw it out there. Um, but um, I think it makes a ton of sense, and and it's long overdue. And to the extent we can do it through the rest of the session, but I would make this a priority for next year, if I'm not defeated by a write-in candidate. <laughs> going to write a, con a contract next year with a lobbyist. They have to pay for their own position by raising enough money for the city budget, um, but assuming they do. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a great idea. I actually have a comment on the content. Um, Me too. Okay. Thank you. Um, Don, why don't you go ahead? Well, um, no, I just wanted, and I keep thinking I've said it, but I'm afraid I haven't, is to add uh, an aspect for public safety. Uh, particularly regional public safety. And there's a new commissioner now for the state's public safety department who's really supporting regional dispatch systems. And as you, some of you may not know, some of the towns in Vermont get free dispatching by the state, but they are trying to get rid of that. But the towns who have it have very strong lobbyists and legislators and keep it. So the new commissioner is really more outwardly stating that he really wants to see a level playing field and that nobody gets free dispatching and that everybody has to become part of some regional system. So I think public safety should definitely be here. And the, and the other piece of that is a real important one is that we have this fight now with AT&T and their proprietoriness and Verizon and our state has chosen its cellular system, AT&T, for emergency assistance, but they want to shut out Verizon. Mass Massachusetts has made a law and all their bids, they have to share. And I would like to see our state do the same thing, saying you cannot make this a proprietary, so that if, if someone's on Verizon or AT&T, they get access to all the buildup that's happening in the state. Do you have any specific, so that feels like two separate items. Yeah, um, they're both under public safety, so they're both if, under if we just had even just a little line well, of public do you, safety. Do you I have can, any suggestion for wording on that? I do not, other than, I guess, public safety focus on regional public safety funding and support by the state, and that we look at cellular coverage. Um, is that specific enough, team? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, thank you, just wanted to make sure that was Thank yes. you for bringing that up. Um, make sure we're clear on that. Um, so my um, question is actually, so under the that second green um, section there, uh, 2020 City of Montpelier Legislative Agenda, number seven, um, support resolution of rail siding down Berry Street through the Sabins Pasture property. I actually thought that we were would have been against that. Yes. Um, which is to say that because um, the the rail right now would like to have um, to, to relocate the line through Savings Pasture. Um, that was just a misunderstanding on my part. Of uh, what, okay. 
So no worries. I think, okay, no, fair enough. I, I, uh, any, yeah, just um, change. Especially as, you know, we're looking to maybe ever have some development there and we'd have this um, uh, shared use path along, uh, along Saban's pasture now and then to put a, a rail right next to it, I think would probably be not so great. But uh, if there's anybody who, um, you know, is in favor of the language as stated, I just wanted to check before we change that. Mm -hmm. No. Okay. Great. Um, cool. Just wanted to make sure that was uh, we're all on board Thanks with that. Thanks for catching that. Um, and to also, I just want to note. Um, well, actually, any anything else on this, um, uh, Lauren? Just so I mean, I guess just trying to figure out the balance between principles and then specificity, both so that we know what we're talking about and make it easier to actually track um, so a lot of this is in the budget so that is what it is some of it you know like uh, number six advocating for global warming solutions so obviously there's like a few bills that are actually moving could or should we be more specific you know bills that meet certain principles such as the global warming solutions act which is a specific bill that if that passed I think it would help us meet our own net zero goals um, and so that's one question, I guess, is, you know, I mean, it's always like the vehicles can change and stuff, so you don't want to lock yourself in. So I think we could write it with enough caveats of what we're trying to get across, but it also would make it easier and more meaningful to advocate for specific pieces of legislation and or like even the, you know, additional human services funding for homeless services. Like if we know what kind of buckets of money those actually are that we can track and be watching. Um, I think the more specific we could get, the more effective we would be at actually being able to do that in a way that would be meaningful. So I think this is... But you're going to give us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Well, so I... I so thank you for bringing that up. I, um, one of the um, fears I had in terms of having this legislative agenda um, on the uh, on our agenda is that there are a couple of uh, pitfalls that I think would be easy to fall into. Like one would be that um, we all, that we each bring our own like very super like hyper specific like this is um, you know something that we really need to see and it's not necessarily particular to um, just like the or, it, or it's not generalized to like the interests of Montpelier, um, but knowing that these are things that that fall within, the, uh, on principle, that they fall within the general goals of the city. Um, you know, that's that's sort of what has crafted um, the, the things here. Um, but I, I think as long as it, as long as a bill, I'm just gonna say this out loud and you can disagree with me, but um, as long as, a, if a specific bill, uh, you know, does some of the things that are laid out here, uh, you know, like, you know, support opportunities that promote um, ecological protection. That 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 then qualifies, I, I imagine. And that I mean, if there is a specific thing, maybe we can just bring it back to touch base. You know, that that's something that you're going to circulate to us. Yeah, it, it could be that we leave it this vague for this, and then yeah. we can try to work on. Here are bills that we think meet these principles yeah. that we. Um, so that might be a way to kind of split the difference. It's just it's. A, a lot of different bills could fit these general goals. Um, so we will probably just need to prioritize which ones yeah, seem the most meaningful us, and, and where we would want to try to make a difference for the city. Um, right. Um, right, yeah. So because any of these things could be political minefields or time sucks. Um, and so I just you know want to be conscious of that. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think it would be valuable to, to know what those things are, especially like as, as any of us end up having conversations with uh, our legislators that we can have, that we can be, you know, specific and say, you know, but have the backing of like, no, we know that this fits um, the, uh, the council's priorities. Just two other yeah. brief thoughts. Um, when we could add something about just to the conversation we were having earlier, there are a couple pieces of legislation related to PFAS that are moving that do reduce the use of PFAS or restrict the use of PFAS in certain products. So kind of getting to what the Department of Environmental Conservation folks were saying. So we could say policies that reduce PFAS that create problems for the city or something. I'd be happy to 
work with Cameron on some language in that if people are amenable. Um, no, I'm convinced it's not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> it's going great. It's going great <laughs> for all of us. Um, are you seeing that as a separate item, like a ten? I mean, it, it could. Or is that underneath ecological protection? We could wrap a phrase into six if we wanted to. Either way. Either way. Um, and then my last thing, we have a lot of VLCT on here, and I, I generally don't, for me personally, I don't find that VLCT represents my values a lot at the State House, and so I don't really love deferring to them. They are often opposed to a lot of the priorities we have listed, and so putting a lot of as if they are representing our city values, their lobbying, I don't think is accurate. And so putting this much language that kind of implies that VLCT is stand, you know, that we're, we're using the values that VLCT is bringing to the state house, they could like literally be lobbying against bills that we would be supporting. And I think that could happen <laughs> often. And so just, just how we word that, I'm not, um, this was just all a proposal that came out of these conversations for you guys it's, to consider. It's a negative there's, place to go. Yeah, there's, <laughs> there's no, no one is wed to this. Um, Donna <laughs> and yeah. But there are three specific things that are listed here I think we do support. I mean, one is our local option tax that we have and we want to continue that support. The second one doesn't say it to me, that's the TIF. Uh, and the whole thing with Act 250 goes into the third one. And likewise, the, the first one. Um, I think those are all three of those clear statements I support, I think the city supports. So maybe we could move those onto our own agenda and not reference them yep. as VLCT yep. priorities, fine. but more Montpelier city priorities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, I'm with you. I'm yep. with you. Yep. Uh, Dan? I don't, I, you know, it, it may make more sense once one, you know, it, uh, it always seems on these legislative uh, agendas, um, we can talk about these different policies and we can't wordsmith too, too precisely because it's often driven in, in part by what's, what's going on and what's, what's really important, you know. So for example, you know, uh, they're always talking government ops about changing how city charters are adopted, which we always have an interest in, you know, because we have a city charter, we amend it from time to time, and if it involved less legislative oversight, that might not be a terrible thing um, and more flexibility and power to the municipality. But is that necessarily our fight as a city? Well, that's, I think, something we can we can talk about and, and discuss. I see a lobbying effort ultimately to be about things that will directly benefit the city. You know, so we talk about financial resources or projects, um, you know, uh, support from the state given their footprint or, you know, we can talk about these bills where we can weigh in on social justice or environmental, you know, PFAS ordinances where we may have a, a particularized interest. But I think at least at first, if we can keep it broad, then we can start to look bill by bill. And, and like any board, you know, that may involve it coming back here and having a brief discussion. Hey, there's H80 that's going to talk about PFAS. Should we should we take a position? Yes or no, or maybe. Um, you know, but I think that can be more as opposed to drawing up a, a constitution of legislative priorities. I, I I think we'll just get bogged down into some of the some of the weeds here that may or may not even be come up as as real issues this time. So my my suggestion would be that you know we can generally work with this, but if Connor and Lauren are going to start to monitor, that's where we start. And then, based on that experience, then that'll inform how we actually draft these legislative priorities. Jack. It's not necessarily a thing for this year, given that we're halfway through the session, but uh, at Legal Aid, we have this process of people who, uh, we've developed a forum for people who want to uh, advocate for doing a certain bill to uh, fill out this form, say, well, here's what, we, what it would do, and here's why I think we should do it, and um, some other information like that. And we might want to consider doing something like that uh, next year and getting started in the fall so that we're prepared when they start up in January. I agree. Just to 
mental note for us all collectively. If So when we send out the budget survey to say what do you want to see or not see in the budget, that might also be a good time to be, to like, let's let's like wrap those things together so that they both, you know, trigger at the same time. Um, uh, Donna. Are we doing a council retreat? Uh, we will be, yes. Okay. Yep, uh, with strategic planning uh, as part of that. Uh, so we've talked about a few changes to this document, um, but uh, thoughts, do, are we ready to have a motion? What do you want to do? Further thoughts? I move we adopt it as, uh, as it's been amended tonight. Second. Um, should we just clarify what those changes are? Yeah, I did want to hear if you had any feedback about the last section, which we, um, I went to our department heads and asked them what specific bills were important to them. Um, so that was for y'all's perusal, if you will. Um, so I didn't know if you wanted to include those or take them out. I'm sorry, the one it would be agenda is different than the one we had previously? No. Well, no, I added a few sentences based on our last conversation about it, but I'm talking about the um, last page. It's called the Department Level Specific Legislation Monitoring. So this is what our department heads are, are currently watching right now. I, I don't have a problem including that because all we're proposing to do around this time is basically send out an email so that if, for example, if the H560 about burial fee for vandalism fund comes up, shoot an email over to, you know, the Cemetery Commission. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just so, just to recap, um, we are reversing the position on seven. <laughs> We're adding nine regarding public safety. Um, and what did we, what would what, you like to do about, do you, do you want to like take the three bullets from DLCT and just add them? to our list or leave it as listed presently? I think that makes sense. What, which and then just elim oh, we'll eliminate the, the League BLCT. of Cities and Towns section, okay. take the three bullet points, move it to ours. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think that makes it a bit cleaner. And then mm -hmm. leave the rest? And so people who moved and seconded, that's okay? This is what you into Okay. Further discussion? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Um, Thank you. Yeah, and thanks, Connor, for bringing this up, oh, no, really. No, thanks, and I, I think it's worthwhile. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. Okay, so that is the end of our regular business. Uh, so, council reports. Donna, are you good to start? I just encourage everybody to show up at town meeting next Tuesday and vote. And I'm on the a ballot twice, once at city council for District 1 and for at-large public Central Vermont Public Safety Authority. Thanks you for your support. Ready? Just want to actually thank Tom Brown and the folks on the bridge. That was a great um, town meeting day spread that they do there. So I think it's a great service to keep everybody in town informed there. And best of luck to the candidates. Uh, one other thing I just want to flag, I read that the Seattle City Council, um, I don't mean to be too provocative, but banned winter evictions from December 1st to March 1st at a meeting a couple weeks ago. Um, so I was hoping to reach out and just get a little more information about that because, you know, as we talk about these sort of heartbreaking uh, matters as we did today, it, uh, yeah, no, it seems un ungodly that somebody would be in the cold here uh, in our community. It's colder than Seattle even. so. I'll bring some information back to the council on that. Thanks. Um, I want to report briefly on a couple of meetings that I've just been at this week. Uh, homelessness Task Force this morning was a really uh, productive meeting. We met with uh, Mary Ellen Mendel of 211 and got uh, kind of a rundown of the, the state of affairs there that uh, taught me an enormous amount. Um, uh, what someone might experience if they are in need of emergency housing after hours, uh, what happens when they call, who they get, how long they have to wait, uh, and all of the, the problems and um, potential solutions to that. Um, 
And uh, on that note, I want to encourage council to uh, uh, get another member, now that I am stepping down, to uh, attend those meetings. It is currently Wednesdays, 11.30 to 1. Uh, and it's always a, a great meeting. <laughs> um, and I think it would be great for the council to continue to have a, a close connection to the Homelessness Task Force because they're doing uh, good work. Um, I also went to uh, Another Way uh, on Monday. I've been visiting them about once a month. Um, and I think that is not a formal council uh, connection. It's just something that they asked me to show up because I was doing the Baguitos morning things. And, um, and I found that it is a, I've said this before, I think many times, but it's a really good connection to have uh, another way really is a community center and it's a, a place where um, not only uh, do I learn an enormous amount of uh, useful uh, information about how people are experiencing the city but also uh, I'm able to share a lot of what goes on here so that they um, the, the community there, knows what's happening with the bike path or with the transit center, at least as much as I do, which is sometimes not that much, but, but it's good. Um, and I would love to see uh, a continued connection um, between the council and, and another way as well on a volunteer basis. But if, if anyone uh, is interested or willing to do that, I think it would be a really great uh, service. Um, I also want to go back briefly to uh, earlier in this meeting and thank the council for considering the uh, homelessness task force ask even outside the regular budget process. I know that's not how, it, and the task force clearly knows that's not how it is usually done. Um, and I think it's a uh, testament to uh, this council's goodwill and, and sensibility that, that we're, we're considering it. Um, as an emergency sort of thing, whether or not it goes forward. Um, and finally, uh, this is my last meeting, uh, so thank you all uh, for uh, giving me a place to hang out on Wednesday nights for the last couple of years. Uh, it's been great. Uh, it's been uh, an honor and a great education to, uh, to serve here. Um, and I want to thank the staff and the council and the, the residents who've uh, so supported me and, and taught me tons of stuff and, and been patient with me. So. Uh, it's been a pleasure, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Very uh, yeah. Well, I want to first of all thank Glenn for his service and for his term. And uh, sorry that we only had a few meetings together. I'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, other than that, I, I would uh, echo the other counselors' uh, call for you know the town meeting day to come and vote and thank the bridge for their extensive coverage of the races. And um, thank you all for this small interim position <laughs> that's coming quickly to an end. The only thing I have to say is to thank Glenn for the time here. He's obviously spent a lot of time beyond what is, is necessarily required to do the job. and. Uh, threw himself into it wholeheartedly, and uh, I've enjoyed having him on the council with me. Um, so I just wanted to update everyone quickly on Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee. We do have a request for proposals out. We've gotten some questions, so hopefully that indicates that we'll get some applications. Um, it's very late, so not to talk about it now, but I did want to get on your radar. There has been a question raised of when we had approved the $10,000. Originally, it had been to look for it in the fiscal year 20 budget, and then we put 10000 in the fiscal year 21 budget that hopefully on town meeting day everyone will approve. Um, so is there two $10,000 pots of money or just one? And so big, we looked back at the records, and it was not clear, and so as we're as we work with potential um, folks, then we wanted clarity so we can make sure that any, and maybe Cameron can explain this better than me, um, or, or provide any clarification, but we certainly want to be crystal clear with any potential um, consultant of what they might expect. 
Um, I do, I do want to expand on that just a, a bit. I'm sorry. Um, it just we do know that the money starts in fiscal year 21. All of the consultants have been told that that's in there. That's in the RFP. Um, my question is, if we like, do we? Does it continue? So is it 10k cut off, and the next year is it 10k cut off, or is it we didn't spend all of the 10k? Does it accumulate? So that was not clear when y'all voted. So I just want to see what the actual intent was. Donna, do you have a comment on that? What, well, I thought that what Lauren asked was different than what you're asking. So Those I, were so two I was, different questions. I was going I had, back yes. one first to Lauren. I made the motion, and the mayor let it be known that she didn't like us to make a motion about money ahead of budget, but I was committed to make sure it got in the budget. Mm -hmm. But it was all about being in the budget for FY21. So it, it's part of the budget, even though we did the first vote before we were have, considering the other budget. And likewise to me, we've never decided ahead whether somebody uh, that I remember carries over. Um, we've never done that. Within departments, departments have it, but not for specific items. So yep. I wouldn't assume it's carried over. Okay. I, I agree uh, with your assessment of the FY21 and then also, you know, thinking about how it works with other committees. For example, the Energy Committee gets $5,000 a year, but um, it's but that's, but that's it doesn't accumulate. It, it goes away. So I assume it would be uh, as it is with other committees. Thank you for the clarity. That yes. will be very helpful for mm -hmm. the committee. And I think is what we expected, but mm -hmm. we just wanted to be crystal clear because sure. um, so um, that's, that is it, and thank you, Glenn. It's been a real pleasure. I really appreciate your thoughtful and heartfelt um, approach, and you will be missed. That is just what I was gonna say. Glenn is just so thoughtful and clearly has like a, a really big heart, and it's, it's really been wonderful to serve with you. Um, and I guess I would just add to, um, it's also been admirable, your commitment to Begito's Thursday mornings. Are you going to keep doing oh, that? right. I forgot to say, I'm going to be there tomorrow. After that, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have other plans to be regularly in public, but it will not be in that way. I think I'd like to do some uh, volunteer portrait sessions or something like that. But anyway, nice. tomorrow will be my last uh, Open ears at Baguitos, 8.30 and 9.30. Well, good on you for doing it. It's, uh, it's very admirable uh, and, and inspiring, even. Um, so thank you. Uh, and that's it for me. Oh, I would just say thanks, Glenn. It's been a pleasure. I'm sorry I hogged the outlet so much <laughs> over the last couple of years. <laughs> this one has a better battery, so I don't have to plug it in anymore. Um, I just mentioned that early voting has been very, very light. Um, not sure what that means. We'll see. But we do have uh, early voting hours on Saturday. The office will be open from 10 to 2. Um, oh, Donna, just so that we forgot to thank Orca. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Who also did a lot for the t all the candidates and for us non candidate people having the time to share city business and our gold. So I really thank them. They're here every meeting, but the additional interviews with Richard Shear was really helpful. Yes. Thank you for remembering that. Yeah. Okay, so first off, thank you guys. It's been fun. Uh, appreciate being up here with y'all. Um, I do want to let you know that tomorrow I will be speaking at the State House regarding support of State Bill 216 about getting us on the exchange. Um, so that'll be at 2.30 if you want to join me. I would really appreciate that. 2.30 <laughs> tomorrow? Yes. Okay. And I will send you the information. Um, I also want to um, publicly... Uh, draw attention to the fact that you did get a report from the Montpelier or the MDC. Um, so if you have any questions, please respond to that. Um, we'll get, we'll make sure that those are communicated. Um, and uh, like the mayor said, we have started talking about strategic planning. Um, if you haven't been told, instead of contracting that out this year, I will be taking on that responsibility. So um, I have a great new format that I'm excited to roll out. So I will be sending an email letting you guys know what that might could look like um, shortly. And um, I do want to thank Glenn. It's been really great um, getting to know you and working with you here and on the task force. So I do appreciate you. Um, that's all I have. Great. 
Okay, so without objection, we'll consider the meeting adjourned.